Zorik Vex's footsteps echoed through the metallic corridor of the galactic exploration vessel Zenith, his three-fingered hand clutching a data pad as if his life depended on it. The ship's alarms blared, their urgent wails matching the frantic beating of his twin hearts. He burst onto the bridge, his translucent skin flushed a deep purple from exertion. Captain Knox, he gasped, his respiratory slits flaring. They breathe corrosive gas. Lyra Knox, the ship's commanding officer, spun around in her hovering chair, her biolite eyes narrowing at the scientist's dramatic entrance. Explain yourself, Zorik. What in the name of the seven moons are you talking about? Zorik thrust the data pad towards her, his appendages trembling. Our atmospheric sensors, Captain, they've detected something. Impossible. The bridge crew, a mix of various alien species, turned their attention to the unfolding scene. Krenthal, the ship's pilot, adjusted their tentacles nervously as they awaited the captain's response. Lyra snatched the pad, her gaze darting across the screen. Her biolite flickered rapidly, a sign of intense concentration among her species. This can't be right, she muttered. Oxygen levels at 21%, nitrogen at 78%, and traces of argon carbon dioxide, and what is this? Zorik nodded vigorously, his cranial ridges pulsing. That's what I'm trying to tell you, Captain. Earth's atmosphere is a cocktail of elements that should be lethal to carbon-based life forms. The oxygen alone would cause rapid oxidation in most known species. It's corrosive, reactive. It should be impossible for complex life to evolve in such conditions. Vera Jax, the ship's xenobiologist, floated over on her anti-grav platform. But Captain, we've been observing Earth for decades. The humans seem to thrive in this environment. How is this possible? Lyra's brow furrowed, creating intricate patterns across her scaled forehead. That's the question, isn't it? Zorik, what do we know about human physiology that could explain this? The scientist tapped furiously on his data pad. Very little, I'm afraid. Our long-range scans have been inconclusive. We've never managed to get close enough for a detailed analysis without risking detection. Well, that's about to change, Lyra declared, her voice filled with determination. Kren, set a course for Earth's orbit. We need to get closer. The pilot's tentacles danced across the ship's controls. Aye, Captain, but what about the risk of discovery? The human's primitive technology shouldn't be able to detect us, but... We'll have to take that chance, Lyra interrupted. This discovery could change everything we thought we knew about life in the universe. Zin Oren, she called to the ship's communications officer, send an encrypted message to High Command. Inform them of our findings and our intent to conduct a closer investigation. Zin's antennae twitched as they processed the order. Right away, Captain. As the zenith altered its course, the crew buzzed with a mixture of excitement and apprehension. Zorik couldn't tear his eyes away from the data streaming across his pad. Captain, he said, his voice barely above a whisper, if the humans can survive in this environment, what else are they capable of? Lyra's expression hardened. That's exactly what we need to find out. This cocktail of death they call air could be the key to understanding their potential as a species. Are they a threat, a potential ally, or something else entirely? The ship's engines hummed as they accelerated towards Earth. On the main view screen, the blue planet grew larger, its swirling clouds concealing the mysteries that lay beneath. Approaching Earth's orbit, Kren announced, activating cloaking field. Suddenly, a red light flashed on the pilot's console. Kren's tentacles writhed in alarm. Captain, I'm detecting an anomaly in the planet's electromagnetic field. It's interfering with our cloaking technology. Lyra leaped from her chair. Evasive maneuvers, Zorik, analyze that field. What are we dealing with? But before Zorik could respond, the ship shuddered violently. Sparks erupted from consoles across the bridge as systems began to fail. We're caught in some kind of energy net, Kren shouted over the chaos. It's pulling us in. As the zenith plummeted towards Earth's surface, Lyra gripped her command chair, 
her mind racing. They had come seeking answers about the human's impossible biology, but now they faced a far more immediate question. How had a supposedly primitive species managed to capture an advanced alien spacecraft? The last thing Lyra saw before losing consciousness was the rapidly approaching ground, and a single thought echoed through her mind. They were about to meet the humans, whether they were ready or not. As consciousness slowly returned to Lyra Knox, she found herself lying on a cold, metallic floor. The acrid smell of burnt circuitry filled her nostrils, and the distant sound of alarms echoed through the ship. She pushed herself up, her vision clearing to reveal the chaos on the bridge. Status report, she barked, her voice hoarse. Zorik Vex stumbled to her side, his usually immaculate appearance now disheveled. Captain, we've crash landed on Earth's surface. Miraculously, our hull integrity is intact, but our systems are severely damaged. Lyra surveyed the bridge. Her crew was battered but alive. Kren, where exactly are we? The pilot's tentacles waved weakly as they checked the few functioning displays. According to our last readings, we're in a region the humans call Nevada. It appears to be a sparsely populated desert area. Small mercies, Lyra muttered. Zorik, what more can you tell us about this atmosphere? We need to know what we're dealing with if we have to leave the ship. The scientist tapped his partially cracked data pad bringing up a holographic display of Earth's atmospheric composition. The crew gathered around, their expressions a mix of fascination and horror. As I mentioned earlier, Earth's air is primarily nitrogen and oxygen, Zorik began, but it's the precise balance that's so lethal to us. The oxygen levels alone would cause rapid oxidation of our respiratory systems, and the nitrogen? At these concentrations, it would lead to severe narcosis in our species. Vera Jax, the xenobiologist, interjected. But that's not all. There are trace amounts of argon, carbon dioxide, and other gases that, in combination, should make this planet utterly inhospitable to complex life. Yet the humans thrive, Lyra mused. How is this possible? Zorik's cranial ridges pulsed with excitement despite their dire situation. That's the fascinating part, Captain. Somehow, humans have evolved not just to survive in this environment, but to depend on it. Their cellular structure, their very biochemistry, must be fundamentally different from anything we've encountered before. The implications hung heavy in the air. If humans could breathe what was essentially poison to most known species, what other extraordinary adaptations might they possess? Pax Kyle, the ship's security chief, spoke up. Captain, given this information, I strongly recommend we abort the mission. We're vulnerable, and we don't know enough about human capabilities. They've already demonstrated technology advanced enough to bring down our ship. Lyra was about to respond when Zin Oren's antennae suddenly stood rigid. Captain, I'm detecting an incoming transmission. It's... it's from the humans. The bridge fell silent as Zin patched the message through the ship's speakers. A crackling voice filled the air, speaking in a language none of them understood. But the universal translator quickly kicked in, converting the words. This is an emergency broadcast. A massive wildfire is approaching the town of Redrock. All residents are ordered to evacuate immediately. Emergency services are overwhelmed. If anyone can assist, please respond. The aliens exchange glances, the weight of the situation pressing down on them. It's a distress call, Lyra said softly. They need help. Pax Kyle shook his head vehemently. Captain, we can't risk exposure. We don't know how the humans will react to our presence. And in our current state, we're in no position to assist anyway. But we can't just leave them to their fate, Vera argued. This could be our chance to learn more about them to understand how they've adapted to this hostile environment. Lyra paced the bridge, her mind racing. The decision before her was monumental. Revealing themselves could change the course of human history and potentially put their own lives at risk. But ignoring the call for help went against everything they stood for as explorers and scientists. Zorik, she said finally, is there any way we can assist without direct contact? perhaps using our technology from a distance? 
The scientist's eyes lit up. Possibly, Captain. Our atmospheric manipulators, if we can get them online, might be able to influence the fire's path or even create a controlled rainstorm to douse the flames. And what about our own safety? Kren asked nervously. If we leave the ship, won't we be poisoned by the air? Vera stepped forward. I may have a solution. Our emergency suits can be modified to filter out the excess oxygen and nitrogen. It won't be comfortable and we can't stay out long, but it should keep us alive for short periods. Lyra nodded, her decision made. All right, here's the plan. Zorik, Vera, work on those suit modifications. Kren, see if you can get our atmospheric manipulators online. Pax, secure the ship and prepare for possible human contact. Zin, monitor all communications. We're going to help these humans, but we're going to do it carefully. As the crew sprang into action, Lyra gazed at the viewscreen showing the alien landscape outside. They had come seeking answers about Earth's bizarre atmosphere, but now found themselves drawn into a rescue mission that could change everything. The risk was enormous, but so was the potential for discovery. Let's just hope, she murmured to herself, that breathing corrosive gas isn't the only trick these humans have up their sleeves. The zenith limped through Earth's atmosphere, its damaged systems straining to maintain altitude. Lyra Knox stood at the helm her biolite eyes fixed on the swirling white landscape below. The Arctic stretched out before them, a vast expanse of ice and snow that seemed to go on forever. We're approaching the coordinates of the distress signal, Captain, Kren Thal announced, their tentacles working furiously over the controls. Zorik Vex, now clad in a bulky modified environment suit, peered at his instruments. The atmospheric composition here is even more extreme than we initially thought. The cold has increased the density of the air, making it even more dangerous for us. Lyra nodded grimly. All the more reason to be cautious. Vera, what's the status on our protective measures? The xenobiologist double-checked the seals on her own suit. The modifications are holding, Captain. But we can't risk exposure for more than an hour. After that, even these filters won't be enough to protect us from the corrosive effects of Earth's air. As the ship descended, a small structure came into view, barely visible through the howling blizzard. It was a research station, its walls battered by wind and ice, a feeble light flickering in one of its windows. Life signs? Lyra asked. Zin Oren's antennae twitched as they scanned the readouts. Just one, Captain. Faint, but stable. Lyra made her decision. Zorik, Vera, you're with me. Pax, keep the ship secure and be ready for immediate extraction if needed. Kren, find us a place to land that won't draw attention. Moments later, Lyra, Zorik, and Vera trudged through knee-deep snow towards the research station. The wind howled around them, ice crystals pelting their protective visors. Lyra couldn't help but marvel at the hostility of this environment. How could anything survive here, let alone thrive? They reached the station's entrance, finding it partially blocked by a snowdrift. Working together, they managed to force the door open, quickly sealing it behind them to prevent the toxic air from following them inside. The interior of the station was dark and cold, lit only by the feeble glow of emergency lights. Equipment lay scattered about, as if abandoned in a hurry. Zorik's suit sensors chirped urgently. Captain, he whispered, his voice tense. The air in here is just as dangerous as outside. Our suits are the only thing keeping us alive. They moved cautiously through the station, following the life sign readings. As they entered what appeared to be a small living area, they found him a human, huddled in a corner, wrapped in layers of insulating material. Jack Miller looked up at the sound of their approach his eyes widening in disbelief and fear at the sight of the alien figures. He scrambled backward, pressing himself against the wall. Who? What are you? He croaked, his voice hoarse from disuse. Lyra stepped forward slowly, her hands raised in a universal gesture of peace. We mean you no harm, she said, the words translated through their communication systems. We received a distress signal and came to help. Jack's eyes darted between the three aliens, 
his mind struggling to process what he was seeing. You're... you're not human, he managed to say. No, we're not, Vera replied gently. But we're here to assist you. Are you injured? Jack shook his head, still wary but desperation overriding his fear. Not injured, just... alone. The others, they left when the storm hit. Said they'd send help, but... He gestured weakly at the desolate station around him. Zorik stepped closer, his scientific curiosity piqued despite the tense situation. How long have you been here alone? Weeks, maybe, Jack replied, his voice cracking. I've lost track. The communications went down, and then the power started failing. I thought, I thought I was going to die here. Lyra felt a pang of sympathy for the human. Abandoned by his own kind, facing certain death, yet still alive. These humans were more resilient than they had imagined. We can help you, she said, but we need to move quickly. Our ability to survive in your atmosphere is limited. Jack's brow furrowed in confusion. Our atmosphere? What do you mean? Vera exchanged a glance with Lyra before explaining, The air you breathe is highly corrosive to our species. We can only withstand it for short periods, even with protection. A look of wonder crossed Jack's face, momentarily displacing his fear and exhaustion. That's incredible. You came to help even though our very air could kill you. Lyra nodded. It's what we do. Now, can you walk? We need to get you to our ship. As Jack struggled to his feet, leaning on Zorik for support, alarms suddenly blared from the aliens' suits. Captain, Zorik said urgently, our filters are degrading faster than anticipated. The extreme cold is affecting their efficiency. We have less than fifteen minutes before our suits fail. Lyra's mind raced. They couldn't leave Jack behind, but every moment they spent in Earth's atmosphere put them at greater risk. As they helped the weakened human towards the exit, she realized that their mission of scientific discovery had become something far more complex, a test of their compassion, ingenuity and the very principles that drove them to explore the stars. The blizzard raged outside, a tempest of ice and poisonous air that stood between them and safety. Lyra knew that the next few minutes would determine not just their fate, but potentially the future of human-alien relations. With determination in her eyes, she led her team and their human charge out into the storm, racing against time and the very elements of Earth itself. The howling wind buffeted the small group as they struggled through the snow towards the zenith. Jack Miller, still weak but driven by a surge of adrenaline, stumbled alongside his alien rescuers. Despite his initial terror, the realization that these beings had risked their lives to save him filled him with a mix of gratitude and fascination. Almost there, Lyra shouted over the storm, her voice distorted by the suit's communication system. As they approached the ship, a hatch opened, revealing Pax Kyle standing ready to assist. The security chief helped pull Jack aboard, then quickly sealed the entrance behind them. Once inside, the aliens immediately removed their helmets, taking deep breaths of the ship's filtered air. Jack watched in amazement as their alien features were fully revealed Lyra's biolite eyes, Zorik's pulsing cranial ridges, and Vera's scaled skin. Are, are you all right? Jack asked hesitantly, noticing their obvious relief at being back inside. Zorik nodded, his breathing slowly returning to normal. Yes, thank you. Your atmosphere is quite challenging for us. Jack's scientific curiosity began to override his fear. You mentioned it was corrosive. How is that possible? Our air sustains life on Earth. Vera stepped forward, her xenobiologist instincts kicking in. That's precisely what makes your planet so fascinating. The very air that allows you to thrive would be lethal to most known species in the galaxy. As if to emphasize the point, Zorik pulled up a holographic display of Earth's atmospheric composition. Jack's eyes widened as he saw the familiar percentages of nitrogen, oxygen, and other gases. But this is just normal air, he said, confused. Lyra shook her head. Not to us. The oxygen levels alone would cause rapid oxidation in our respiratory systems, 
and the nitrogen concentration would lead to severe narcosis. Jack's mind reeled as he processed this information. So, you're saying that humans have evolved to breathe what's essentially poison to you? Exactly, Vera confirmed. And it's not just your respiratory system. Your entire physiology must be adapted to function in this environment. It's remarkable. As they spoke, Zorik had been working feverishly at a console. Captain, he called out, I believe I've found a solution to allow us to breathe more safely while on Earth. If we can synthesize a compound that mimics the human body's natural antioxidants, we might be able to counteract the corrosive effects of the oxygen. Jack's scientific training kicked in. Wait, antioxidants? Like what we get from fruits and vegetables. Zorik looked at him with newfound interest. Yes, precisely. Your bodies naturally produce these compounds to protect against oxidative stress. If we can replicate and enhance this process, we might be able to survive in your atmosphere for extended periods. As Zorik worked on synthesizing the compound, Vera began a more thorough scan of Jack's physiology. Her eyes widened as the results came in. This is incredible, she murmured. Jack, your body's ability to regulate oxygen usage is far more advanced than we initially thought, and your cellular repair mechanisms. They're operating at a level we've never seen before. Jack shifted uncomfortably under the scrutiny. Is that unusual? Lyra stepped in, her tone serious. It's more than unusual. It's unprecedented. The way your body handles the toxic elements in your atmosphere suggests that humans might be far more adaptable than we realized. A thought struck Jack. Wait, if our air is so dangerous to you, how did you even detect life on Earth in the first place? The aliens exchanged glances. We've been observing Earth from a distance for some time, Lyra admitted. But we never imagined the extent of your physiological differences. It's possible that these adaptations extend beyond just breathing. As if on cue, Vera gasped, staring at her scanner. Captain, you need to see this. The human's DNA. It's incredibly resilient. It shows signs of being able to repair itself from damage that would be fatal to most species. Jack's head spun with the implications. Are you saying humans are some kind of super beings? Not exactly, Zorik interjected, looking up from his work. But you've evolved to thrive in conditions that would be lethal to most. It raises fascinating questions about the potential of human physiology. Lyra's expression turned thoughtful. It also raises concerns. If humans can adapt to such extreme conditions, what else might they be capable of? As the aliens continued their analysis, Jack found himself grappling with a profound shift in perspective. He had always thought of humans as relatively fragile creatures, vulnerable to the whims of nature. But now, seeing himself through alien eyes, he began to understand that humanity's greatest strength might be its ability to survive and adapt in a universe that seemed determined to destroy it. The zenith hummed around them, its systems working to repair the damage from the crash. Outside, the Arctic storm raged on, a reminder of the harsh world that had shaped human evolution. And within the ship, a new understanding was dawning one that would forever change the way both humans and aliens viewed their place in the cosmos. The zenith shuddered as another gust of arctic wind battered its hull. Inside, Jack Miller sat in the transparent quarantine chamber, watching the alien crew bustling around him with a mixture of awe and apprehension. He felt like a specimen in a zoo, or worse, a lab rat in an experiment he didn't fully understand. Lyra Knox approached the chamber, her biolite eyes flickering with curiosity. How are you feeling, Jack? Her translated voice came through the speakers. Physically? Better, Jack admitted, his strength slowly returning. Mentally? I'm not so sure. I appreciate you saving my life, but what exactly are your plans for me? Vera Jacks, monitoring Jack's vital signs, chimed in. We assure you, we mean you no harm. Your physiology is simply fascinating to us. We've never encountered a species that could thrive in such a toxic environment. Jack couldn't help but chuckle darkly. Toxic? 
that toxic environment is the only home humanity has ever known. Are you saying the entire earth is poisonous to you? In a manner of speaking, yes, Lara nodded, which makes your species' ability to not just survive, but flourish, all the more remarkable. As they spoke, Zorik Vex burst into the room, his cranial ridges pulsing with excitement. Captain, I've made a discovery about the human's DNA. You need to see this immediately. Lyra turned to the scientist. Her attention peaked. What have you found, Zorik? Zorik activated a holographic display, showing a complex double helix structure that Jack recognized as DNA. But as he looked closer, he noticed strange patterns and structures he'd never seen before. This, Zorik explained, pointing to an unusual sequence, is unlike anything we've ever encountered. The human DNA doesn't just adapt to its environment, it actively incorporates elements from it. Vera leaned in, her scales shimmering under the hologram's light. Are you saying their DNA can assimilate environmental factors? Precisely, Zorik nodded vigorously. It appears that over millennia, human DNA has incorporated genetic information from various sources viruses, bacteria, even trace elements from their atmosphere and food sources. This has led to an incredibly robust and adaptable genetic structure. Jack's scientific mind was reeling. Wait, are you saying we've been evolving by absorbing genetic material from our environment? In layman's terms, yes, Zorik confirmed. This could explain your species' remarkable resilience and adaptability. You're not just surviving in a toxic environment, you're constantly evolving to thrive in it. Lyra's expression turned grave. This changes everything. If humans have this level of adaptive capability, they could potentially survive in environments we consider completely inhospitable. The implications for space travel, colonization, or warfare, Pax Kyle interjected, the security chief's tone wary. A species with this ability could be a significant threat if they decided to expand aggressively. Jack felt a chill run down his spine. Now hold on, he protested. We're not some warmongering species looking to conquer the galaxy. We're just trying to survive on our own planet. Lyra held up a hand to calm the rising tension. No one is accusing humanity of anything, Jack. But you must understand, this discovery is unprecedented. It raises questions we never thought to ask before. As the aliens debated the implications, Jack's mind raced. He thought about human history, the countless times his species had faced extinction-level events and survived. The ice ages, the plagues, the natural disasters had their DNA been adapting and evolving through it all. There's more, Zorik added, his voice hushed with awe. The human's DNA shows signs of self-directed evolution. It's as if their genetic code can anticipate environmental changes and begin adapting before they even occur. The room fell silent as the weight of this revelation sank in. Jack felt a mix of pride and fear. Pride in humanity's incredible resilience, but fear of how this knowledge might be used either by the aliens or by humans themselves if this information ever got out. What does this mean for your mission? Jack asked, breaking the silence. And for me. Lyra turned to him, her expression unreadable. It means, Jack Miller, that you may be the key to unlocking secrets about life in the universe that we never imagined existed. But it also means that we cannot, in good conscience, simply return you to Earth and leave. The potential consequences are too great. Jack's heart sank. So I'm your prisoner now. Not a prisoner, Lyra corrected. An ambassador. Perhaps the most important ambassador humanity has ever had. We need to understand more about your species, and you need to understand more about the galaxy you're a part of. As the storm raged outside, Jack realized that his rescue had become something far more complex. He was no longer just Jack Miller, Arctic researcher. He was now a representative of humanity to the stars, carrying within his very DNA secrets that could reshape the understanding of life itself. The Zenith's engines hummed to life, preparing to leave Earth's atmosphere. Jack watched his home planet recede through a viewscreen, a swirling blue marble in the vastness of space. He didn't know what awaited him among the stars, 
but he knew that nothing would ever be the same again for him, for humanity, or for the alien civilization that had discovered them. As the zenith ascended through Earth's atmosphere, the alien crew gathered in the ship's conference room. The holographic display of human DNA rotated slowly in the center of the table, its unique structures a constant reminder of the monumental discovery they had made. Lyra Knox stood at the head of the table, her biolite eyes scanning the faces of her crew. We need to discuss the implications of Zorik's findings, she began, her voice grave. This isn't just a scientific curiosity anymore. We're dealing with information that could reshape galactic politics. Zorik Vex nodded enthusiastically, his cranial ridges pulsing with excitement. The adaptive capabilities of human DNA are beyond anything we've ever encountered. Their genetic code doesn't just allow them to survive in their toxic environment, it thrives on challenge. It's as if their very essence is designed to conquer adversity. Vera Jax, the xenobiologist, leaned forward. From a biological standpoint, this is revolutionary. Imagine the applications. We could potentially use this knowledge to develop treatments for species struggling to adapt to changing environments across the galaxy. Or weapons, Pax Kyle interjected, his security training coming to the fore. A species that can rapidly adapt to any environment could be an unstoppable military force. If this information falls into the wrong hands. The room fell silent as the implications sank in. Krenthal's tentacles writhed nervously as they spoke up. What about our duty to report this to high command? This kind of discovery falls well within mandatory reporting protocols. Lyra's biolite flickered, a sign of deep thought among her species. That's the crux of our dilemma. If we report this, we're potentially putting the human species at risk. They could be seen as a resource to be exploited rather than a sentient species to be protected. Zin Oren's antennae twitched as they considered the diplomatic ramifications. We must also consider how this would affect our standing in the Galactic Council. Earth is still classified as a pre-contact civilization. By interfering and obtaining this knowledge, we've already breached several protocols. As the debate continued, Jack Miller sat in his quarantine chamber, watching the proceedings through a video feed. His mind raced, trying to process the enormous implications of what he was hearing. He pressed the communication button. Excuse me, his voice came through the speakers in the conference room, causing the aliens to turn towards the screen showing his face. I think I should have a say in this. You're talking about the fate of my entire species. Lyra nodded, gesturing for the others to listen. You're right, Jack. What are your thoughts on this matter? Jack took a deep breath, choosing his words carefully. I understand the significance of what you've discovered about our DNA, but I need you to understand something too. Humanity's adaptability isn't just in our genes, it's in our culture, our spirit. We've faced extinction-level events throughout our history and always found a way to survive, to push forward. He paused, looking each alien in the eye through the screen. If you share this information, you're not just revealing a biological quirk. You're exposing the very essence of what makes us human. Our resilience, our drive to explore and overcome these aren't just genetic traits. They're who we are. The aliens exchanged glances, clearly moved by Jack's words. Zorik spoke up, his tone thoughtful. Perhaps we've been looking at this all wrong. Instead of seeing humans as a resource or a potential threat, we should be considering them as potential allies. Vera nodded in agreement. Their adaptability could be invaluable in joint exploration efforts. Imagine having a species that could help us survive on worlds we've never been able to set foot on before. Lyra raised a hand, calling for silence. These are all valid points, but we still haven't addressed the core issue. Do we report this to high command or not? The room fell silent once more, the weight of the decision palpable. Finally, Pax Kyle, who had been the most cautious, spoke up. What if we take a middle ground? We report the discovery of a highly adaptable species, but withhold the specifics of their DNA. We could emphasize the potential for peaceful cooperation without revealing the full extent of their capabilities. Lyra's eyes lit up. 
that could work. We fulfill our duty to report, but we also protect the humans from potential exploitation. It would give us time to establish a relationship with Earth on more equal footing. As the crew began to nod in agreement, Jack felt a glimmer of hope. So what happens now, he asked. Lyra turned to the screen, her expression softening. Now, Jack Miller, we prepare for a new era of galactic diplomacy. You're no longer just a rescued scientist. You're going to help us introduce humanity to the stars on your own terms. The zenith continued its ascent, leaving the blue marble of Earth behind. As they plotted a course for deep space, the ship carried with it not just a groundbreaking scientific discovery, but the seeds of a partnership that could change the fate of two species and perhaps the entire galaxy. Jack's heart raced as he processed the aliens' conversation. The realization that humanity's very existence could be at stake spurred him into action. He couldn't just sit idly by while these beings decided the fate of his species. Scanning the quarantine chamber, Jack's scientific mind kicked into overdrive. He noticed a small panel near the floor, likely housing the chamber's environmental controls, if he could just reach it. Feigning exhaustion, Jack slumped to the floor, positioning himself near the panel. As he pretended to rest, his fingers worked deftly, prying at the edges of the cover. Meanwhile, in the conference room, the alien crew continued their debate, unaware of Jack's actions. We need to consider the long-term implications, Lyra was saying. If we... An alarm suddenly blared through the ship, cutting her off. Red lights flashed as Krenthal's console lit up with warnings. The quarantine chamber, Kren exclaimed, tentacles writhing in agitation. Its environmental systems are malfunctioning. On the video feed, they saw Jack slumped on the floor, apparently unconscious. He could be dying, Vera cried out. We need to get him out of there. Lyra made a split-second decision. Kren, go, get him out and secure him. We can't risk losing our only human subject. As Kren rushed out, Zorik's eyes narrowed, studying the feed. Captain, he said slowly, I don't think this is a malfunction. Back in the chamber, Jack heard the approaching footsteps. His fingers had just managed to cross the right wires, causing the chamber's door to slide open with a hiss. He took a deep breath of the ship's air still alien to him, but no longer filtered through the quarantine systems. Jack scrambled to his feet just as Kren burst into the room. The security officer's multiple eyes widened in surprise, realizing the human's deception. Stop, Kren's translated voice boomed, tentacles reaching for Jack. But Jack was already moving. His time in the Arctic had honed his survival instincts, and now, fueled by adrenaline and the desperate need to warn Earth, he ducked under Kren's grasping limbs. Jack's smaller size and agility gave him an advantage in the confined space of the corridor. He darted past Kren, mind racing to recall the ship's layout he'd glimpsed on screens earlier. Kren's powerful legs propelled the alien after Jack, closing the distance quickly. You don't understand the danger, Kren called out. The ship's atmosphere isn't safe for you. But Jack pressed on, his lungs burning with the effort. He could feel the alien air affecting him, making his head spin, but he forced himself to adapt, to push through the discomfort. Rounding a corner, Jack spotted what he was looking for a communications terminal. If he could just reach it, send a message, a warning. Kren's tentacle wrapped around Jack's ankle, sending him crashing to the floor. He kicked out, struggling against the alien's superior strength. Please, Jack gasped, you don't understand. I can't let you decide the fate of my entire species without warning them. Kren hesitated, multiple eyes blinking in confusion. This moment of uncertainty was all Jack needed. He twisted, breaking free from the tentacle's grasp, and lunged for the terminal. His fingers flew over the alien interface, desperately trying to decipher its functions. Behind him, Kren approached cautiously, realizing the delicacy of the situation. Jack, Kren said, voice softer now, we're not your enemies, we're trying to protect your species. Jack's hand hovered over what he hoped was the transmission button. By deciding our fate without our input, by treating us like lab rats. 
Kren's tentacles lowered slightly. You're right. We. I was wrong to treat you that way. But please, don't send that message. You could be dooming your planet to invasion or exploitation if the wrong people intercept it. Jack's mind raced, weighing the risks. Could he trust these aliens? Or was this just another ploy? At that moment, Lyra's voice came over the ship's intercom. Jack, please listen. We've made a decision. We want to work with you, as equals, to determine the best way forward. No secrets, no hidden agendas. Your species adaptability is remarkable. But it's your intelligence and spirit that truly impress us. Help us make first contact the right way. Jack's hand trembled over the console. The sincerity in Lyra's voice, the genuine concern in Kren's eyes, could he take this leap of faith? Slowly, he lowered his hand. Okay, he said, voice hoarse from exertion and emotion. Let's talk. But as equals, not as jailer and prisoner. Kren nodded, tentacles relaxing. Agreed? And, I apologize for underestimating you. Your adaptability is truly impressive. As they made their way back to the conference room, Jack realized that this confrontation had done more than just secure his freedom. It had demonstrated to the aliens that humans were not just subjects to be studied, but beings capable of quick thinking, determination, and diplomacy. The future of human-alien relations hung in the balance, and Jack Miller, Arctic researcher turned reluctant ambassador, was now at the heart of it all. As the tension from Jack's escape attempt subsided, an uneasy truce settled over the zenith. Jack found himself no longer confined to the quarantine chamber, but still under close observation. The alien crew watched him with a mixture of fascination and wariness, their perception of humans irrevocably changed by his daring actions. It was during one of his permitted walks around the ship that Jack encountered Vera Jacks in the medical bay. The xenobiologist was poring over holographic displays of human and alien physiologies, her scaled brow furrowed in concentration. Jack, she said, noticing his presence. I'm glad you're here. I've been studying the data we've collected, and I believe there's something you should see. Curious, Jack approached the display. Vera manipulated the hologram, highlighting specific areas of human DNA alongside alien genetic structures. Your adaptability isn't just a defensive mechanism, she explained, her eyes shining with excitement. It's a key to unlocking potential we've never imagined. The way your DNA incorporates and utilizes environmental factors. It could revolutionize our approach to medicine, terraforming, even space travel. Jack's scientific mind word with possibilities. You're talking about breakthroughs that could benefit both our species. Vera nodded enthusiastically. Exactly. But for this to work, we need cooperation, not secrecy. Your people need to be prepared for what's coming. A moment of understanding passed between them. Jack lowered his voice. You want to warn Earth. Not just warn, Vera replied, glancing nervously at the door. Prepare. If we approach this the right way, it could be the beginning of an unprecedented alliance. Jack's heart raced. This was the opportunity he'd been hoping for. How can we do it without alerting the others? Vera's fingers danced over a nearby console. I can disguise a transmission as routine medical data, but we'll need to be quick and careful with the message. Too much information could be dangerous if intercepted. Together, they crafted a coded message, embedding it within a complex stream of biological data. Jack's years of research experience came in handy as they wove warnings and key information into seemingly innocuous scientific jargon. Just as they were about to transmit, the medical bay door slid open. Jack's heart nearly stopped as Captain Lyra Knox stepped in, her biolite eyes narrowing at the scene before her. What's going on here? Lyra demanded, her gaze shifting between Jack and Vera. Vera straightened, her scales shimmering with nervous energy. Captain, I can explain. We were just... Sending an unauthorized transmission to Earth, Lyra finished her voice cold. Did you really think we wouldn't detect it? Jack stepped forward, placing himself between Lyra and Vera. It was my idea, Captain. Vera was just trying to help. 
Lyra's eyes flashed. Help betray us, you mean? After everything we've discussed about the delicate nature of this situation. It's not betrayal, Jack argued, his voice firm despite his racing pulse. It's ensuring fairness. My people deserve to know what's coming, to have a say in their future. The captain's biolite flickered rapidly, a sign of intense internal conflict. Do you have any idea what you've done? If that message is intercepted by the wrong parties, it could lead to Earth's exploitation or worse. Vera stepped up beside Jack. Captain, please. The message is coded, embedded in scientific data. It won't mean anything to anyone who doesn't know what to look for. We were careful. Lyra's gaze bore into them both. And what exactly did this careful message say? Jack took a deep breath. It warned of impending first contact. It stressed the importance of unity and preparation, not fear. And it provided just enough information about our unique attributes to ensure Earth's scientists will take it seriously. For a long moment, silence reigned in the medical bay. Lyra's expression was unreadable, her alien features masking whatever thoughts raced behind those light eyes. Finally, she spoke. You've put me in an impossible position. As captain, I should confine you both and report this breach of protocol immediately. Jack and Vera exchanged worried glances, but Lyra wasn't finished. However, she continued, her voice softening slightly, as a scientist and an explorer, I understand the drive to protect one's home and species. Your actions, while reckless, come from a place of loyalty and foresight. She turned to the console, examining the transmitted data. This message, it's cleverly constructed. It provides hope and caution in equal measure. Perhaps, perhaps this isn't the disaster I initially thought. Relief washed over Jack, but it was short-lived. Lyra's tone hardened again. But make no mistake, this cannot happen again. From now on, all communications regarding Earth and humans go through me. Is that clear? Both Jack and Vera nodded solemnly. Good, Lyra said. Now, we need to prepare for the consequences of your actions. If Earth responds to this message, we'll need to be ready. And if other parties intercept it, we'll need to be even more prepared. As Lyra left the medical bay, Jack and Vera shared a look of cautious optimism. They had taken an enormous risk, but in doing so, they had also taken the first real step towards a future where humans and aliens might stand together as equals. The Zenith continued its journey through the stars, now carrying not just a human passenger, but the weight of two civilizations on the brink of a historic encounter. The die had been cast, and the true challenge was only beginning. The zenith shuddered, its systems groaning under an unseen strain. Alarms blared throughout the ship, their urgent wails echoing through every corridor. Jack Miller, still reeling from the confrontation in the medical bay, felt a shift in the air around him. Something was wrong. Captain Lyra Knox's voice crackled over the intercom, tension evident even through the translation. All crew to the bridge immediately. We have a critical situation. Jack followed the rushing aliens, his heart pounding. As they entered the bridge, he saw Zorik Vex hunched over a console, his cranial ridges pulsing rapidly in distress. Report, Lyra commanded, her biolite eyes scanning the chaotic scene. Zorik's voice was strained. Captain, the life support systems are failing. The crash on Earth and our hasty departure have caused more damage than we realized. The ship... It's slowly filling with Earth's atmosphere. A collective gasp rippled through the alien crew. Jack watched as their expressions shifted from confusion to horror as the implications sank in. Kren Thal, still wary of Jack after their earlier confrontation, spoke up. How long do we have? Zorik's fingers danced over the controls. At the current rate of degradation, we have approximately six hours before the ship's atmosphere becomes lethal to us. Lyra's gaze locked onto Jack. You, you breathe this air naturally. Can you help us? Jack's mind raced. He was a scientist, yes, but atmospheric systems of an advanced alien spacecraft were far beyond his expertise. 
Yet, he realized, he might be the crew's only hope. I'll do what I can, he said, stepping forward. But I need to understand your physiology better. What exactly makes Earth's air toxic to you? Vera Jax moved to a nearby console, pulling up diagrams of alien respiratory systems. The high oxygen content causes rapid oxidation in our bodies, and the nitrogen, it's like a narcotic to us in these concentrations. Jack nodded, an idea forming. Okay, we need to think about this from two angles. First, we need to slow the influx of Earth's atmosphere. Second, we need to find a way to protect you from its effects. The next few hours were a flurry of activity. Jack worked alongside Zorik and Vera, his knowledge of human biology providing insights the aliens had never considered. They sealed off non-essential areas of the ship, buying precious time. What about your emergency suits? Jack asked, remembering how they had rescued him on Earth. Pax Kyle, the security chief, shook his head. They're designed for short-term use only. We'd burn through our supply in hours. Jack's eyes lit up. But what if we could modify them? Human deep-sea divers use special gas mixtures to avoid nitrogen narcosis. If we could adjust the suit's filters to reduce oxygen and nitrogen levels. Zorik's cranial ridges pulsed with excitement. Yes, and if we combine that with a compound similar to your hemoglobin to help process the remaining oxygen more efficiently. As they worked, Jack couldn't help but notice the change in the alien's demeanor. The suspicion and wariness were gone, replaced by a spirit of cooperation born from desperate necessity. With less than an hour to spare, they had a prototype. Vera volunteered to test it, her scaled hands shaking slightly as she donned the modified suit. How do you feel? Lyra asked, tension evident in her voice. Vera took a deep breath, then another. It's, it's working. I can breathe. It's not comfortable, but it's not killing me. A cheer went up from the crew. Quickly, they began modifying the remaining suits, but as relief washed over them, a new realization set in. Lyra turned to Jack, her biolite eyes shimmering with a mix of gratitude and concern. We can survive now, thanks to you, but our ship is still filled with an atmosphere that's poisonous to us. We can't pilot it effectively in these suits. We're stranded. Jack looked out at the star-filled viewscreen, the vastness of space suddenly feeling very immediate. So what do we do now? The captain's gaze was resolute. We have no choice. We need to return to Earth. It's the only place we can safely repair our ship. The implications hung heavy in the air, return to Earth a planet of beings who could breathe poison, who had evolved in ways the aliens had never imagined possible. A planet that now knew, thanks to Jack and Vera's message, that first contact was imminent. If we go back, Jack said slowly, everything changes, for both our species. Lyra nodded, her expression a mix of apprehension and excitement. Indeed, it seems, Jack Miller, that you'll be making first contact much sooner than any of us anticipated. Are you ready for that responsibility? As the zenith changed course, turning back toward the blue marble that was Earth, Jack felt the weight of history on his shoulders. He had wanted to warn his planet, to give humanity a chance to prepare. Now, he would be the one to guide that first, crucial interaction. Ready or not, he said, squaring his shoulders, here we come. The ship accelerated, carrying with it a crew of aliens who now owed their lives to human ingenuity, and a human who had glimpsed the wonders and dangers of the cosmos. As Earth grew larger in their view, one thing was certain, the universe would never be the same again. As the zenith hurtled back towards Earth, Jack Miller found himself in the ship's medical bay, undergoing yet another round of tests. But this time, it wasn't just the aliens who were surprised by the results. This is unprecedented, Vera Jax murmured, her scaled fingers dancing over the holographic display of Jack's latest scans. Your cellular structure is changing, adapting at a rate we've never seen before. Jack flexed his fingers, feeling a strange new strength coursing through his body. I noticed I've been feeling different, stronger, more alert, 
I thought it was just adrenaline from everything that's happened. Zorik Vex leaned in, his cranial ridges pulsing with excitement and a hint of concern. It's far more than that, Jack. Your exposure to our technology, combined with the unique stressors of space travel, seems to have accelerated your species' natural adaptability. You're evolving before our eyes. The implications of this discovery hung heavy in the air. Jack's mind raced with possibilities and questions. What does this mean? Am I? Dangerous? Captain Lyra Knox, who had been silently observing from the corner, stepped forward. Her biolite eyes flickered with a mix of fascination and wariness. That remains to be seen. What's clear is that we've underestimated the potential of human physiology. Again. As if to emphasize her point, Jack accidentally crushed the metal examination table he was gripping, leaving deep impressions of his fingers in the alien alloy. He jumped back, startled by his own strength. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. It's all right, Lyra interrupted, her voice calm but her posture tense. But I think we need to reevaluate our approach to this situation. Kren, please escort Jack to a secure room while we discuss our next steps. Jack felt a flicker of fear. Am I a prisoner now? Lyra's expression softened slightly. No, Jack, but you must understand our position. You're developing abilities we don't fully understand at an alarming rate. We need to ensure the safety of everyone on this ship, including you. As Kren Thal led him away, Jack caught snippets of the aliens' hurried conversation. Words like potential threat and military applications made his stomach churn. In his new quarters, more comfortable but clearly designed to contain someone of great strength, Jack paced restlessly. He could feel the changes in his body accelerating. His senses seemed sharper, his mind clearer. He found he could process information faster, recalling details from scientific papers he'd read years ago with perfect clarity. Hours passed, and Jack's anxiety grew. What were the aliens planning? And more importantly, what was happening to him? A soft chime announced a visitor. The door slid open to reveal Vera, her expression a mix of concern and scientific curiosity. How are you feeling, Jack? she asked, entering the room cautiously. Like a lab rat, he replied, then immediately regretted his harsh tone. I'm sorry, I'm just... scared. I don't understand what's happening to me. Vera nodded sympathetically. None of us do, not fully, but I've been arguing on your behalf. You saved our lives, Jack. We owe you a debt, and treating you like a threat isn't the way to repay it. Jack felt a surge of gratitude towards the xenobiologist. Thank you, Vera. But what happens now? I can feel myself changing, growing stronger. I'm not sure I can control it. Before Vera could respond, alarms blared throughout the ship. Captain Lyra's voice came over the intercom, tense and urgent. All hands, brace for impact. We're caught in Earth's gravity well and our systems are failing. The ship shuddered violently, throwing both Jack and Vera off balance. Without thinking, Jack reached out, catching Vera and steadying her with his newfound strength. Their eyes met, a moment of understanding passing between them. We need your help, Jack, Vera said quickly. Your enhanced abilities might be our only chance to survive this crash. Jack nodded, determination replacing fear. Let's go. As they raced towards the bridge, Jack marveled at how easily he navigated the shaking corridors, his reflexes and balance far beyond what they had been just days ago. They burst onto the bridge to find chaos. Consoles sparked, alien crew members struggled to maintain control. Lyra turned as they entered, her eyes widening at Jack's presence. I thought I ordered... With all due respect, Captain, Jack interrupted, moving swiftly to a malfunctioning console. You need me. We can discuss my status after we survive this landing. To everyone's surprise, Jack's fingers flew over the alien controls with intuitive ease. He found himself understanding the ship's systems at a fundamental level, making adjustments and repairs faster than even the trained crew. As Earth's surface rushed up to meet them, Jack felt a strange calm settle over him. He was no longer just a passenger in this cosmic drama. He was an active participant, 
his evolving abilities bridging the gap between human and alien technology. The zenith screened through Earth's atmosphere, its hull glowing with the heat of re-entry. Jack worked in perfect synchronization with the alien crew, his enhanced mind processing information at incredible speeds. As they fought for control, one thing became clear to everyone on board. The dynamic between Jack and the aliens had irrevocably changed. He was no longer just a curiosity or a potential threat. He had become something entirely new, a human evolving beyond the limits of his species, standing on the precipice of a new era of interstellar cooperation. As the ship hurtled towards an uncertain landing, the future of human-alien relations hung in the balance, with Jack Miller at its very center. The zenith lay half-buried in the sandy dunes of the Sahara Desert, its hull still cooling from the fiery descent through Earth's atmosphere. Inside, the alien crew and their human passenger were recovering from their harrowing landing, the ship's emergency systems having prevented total disaster. Jack Miller stood on the bridge, gazing out at the endless expanse of sand through a cracked viewscreen. His enhanced senses could pick up minute details miles away, a constant reminder of his evolving abilities. Captain Lyra Knox approached, her biolite eyes flickering with a mix of emotions. Jack, we've received a transmission from our homeworld. They've, they've ordered us to capture more humans for study. Jack turned, his expression hardening. I assume they're not inviting us over for tea and crumpets. Lyra's translator struggled with the idiom, but she understood the sentiment. No, they're not. They view your species as a potential weapon, a resource to be exploited. The high command is, intrigued by your adaptability. The bridge fell silent as the implications sank in. Zorik Vex nervously adjusted his instruments, while Vera Jax looked between Jack and the captain, concern etched on her scaled features. Jack's mind raced, processing the situation with his newfound mental acuity. And what do you think, Captain? Are you going to follow those orders? Lyra's biolite pulsed rapidly, a sign of internal conflict. I... I don't know. This goes against everything we stand for as explorers and scientists, but defying direct orders from high command. It would mean exile, at best, Krenthal interjected, their tentacles writhing anxiously. At worst, we'd be branded as traitors. Jack paced the bridge, his movements fluid and purposeful. He could feel the eyes of the alien crew on him, a mix of fear, curiosity, and hope. He realized that in this moment, he wasn't just fighting for humanity's future, but for the souls of these aliens who had become his unlikely allies. There has to be another way, Jack said, his voice filled with determination. A way that doesn't involve treating my species like lab rats or weapons, but also doesn't force you to sacrifice everything. Vera stepped forward, her scientific curiosity overriding her caution. What if we could demonstrate that humans are more valuable as allies than as test subjects? Jack's abilities, his rapid adaptation to our technology, it's proof that our species could achieve incredible things together. Zorik's cranial ridges pulsed with excitement. Yes, if we could present evidence of successful cooperation, of mutual benefits. It's too risky, Pax Kyle, the security chief, cut in. We'd be staking everything on the hope that our leaders would listen to reason. And if they don't, we'd be giving them even more reason to want to control humans. As the debate heated up, Jack felt a strange sensation wash over him. His enhanced senses seemed to expand further, and suddenly he could perceive the electromagnetic fields generated by the ship's systems and the aliens themselves. An idea began to form. What if, Jack said slowly, his eyes gleaming with inspiration. We could show your leaders that humans aren't just adaptable, but that we can actively enhance your own technology. All eyes turned to him, a mix of confusion and intrigue on the alien faces. Jack continued, his confidence growing. I can sense the energy fields around us. I think, I think I can interface with your systems directly, improve them in ways you haven't even imagined. Lyra's eyes widened. That's impossible. Our technology is far beyond. But Jack was already moving. He placed his hand on a nearby console, and to everyone's astonishment, 
The damaged systems began to repair themselves. Holographic displays flickered to life, showing schematics and improvements that even Zorik, with all his expertise, struggled to comprehend. By the seven moons, Zorik breathed, his scientific mind reeling at the implications. Jack turned to the stunned crew, his eyes glowing faintly with the energy coursing through him. This is just the beginning. Imagine what we could achieve together, as equals. Isn't that worth fighting for? Lyra stood silent for a long moment, her internal struggle visible in the rapid flickering of her biolite. Finally, she straightened, her decision made. All right, Jack Miller, you've shown us a glimpse of what's possible, but we're still in a precarious position. How do you propose we proceed? Jack's mind was already racing ahead, formulating plans and contingencies with lightning speed. First, we need to establish contact with Earth's governments, but on our terms. We'll need to move quickly before your homeworld sends others to carry out their orders. He turned to each crew member, his gaze intense. Zorik, I'll need your help to further integrate my abilities with the ship systems. Vera, we need to prepare a comprehensive report on the benefits of human-alien cooperation. Kren, plot us a course to a secure location where we can make contact without causing panic. As the crew sprang into action, energized by this new sense of purpose, Jack felt the weight of responsibility settling on his shoulders. He was no longer just Jack Miller, Arctic researcher. He had become humanity's first line of defense, a bridge between two civilizations, and perhaps the key to a future where humans and aliens could stand together as equals. The Sahara sun beat down on the partially buried zenith, but inside, a new hope was taking root. As Jack interfaced with the ship systems, pushing both himself and the alien technology to new limits, he knew that the real challenge was just beginning. The fate of two species now hung in the balance, and he was determined to find a way forward that would benefit them all. The zenith hummed with renewed energy as it rose from the Sahara sands, its systems now operating at peak efficiency thanks to Jack's unprecedented interface. The alien crew worked with a sense of urgency, preparing for their return to civilization and the challenges that lay ahead. Jack stood at the newly repaired view screen, his enhanced vision picking out the curvature of the Earth as they ascended. We need to move fast, he said, turning to Captain Lyra. Emma Davis is brilliant, but she's also cautious. If we don't reach her before news of our presence spreads, she might go into hiding. Lyra nodded, her biolite eyes flickering with a mix of determination and concern. Agreed? Kren, set a course for this Cambridge location Jack has provided. As the ship accelerated, Zorik approached Jack, his cranial ridges pulsing with excitement. Your ability to interface with our technology is remarkable. I've been analyzing the improvements you've made, and they're, well, they're beyond anything we've ever conceived. Jack smiled, still marveling at his newfound abilities. It's like the ship is an extension of myself now. I can feel every system, every circuit. Suddenly, alarms blared across the bridge. Pax Kyle's tentacles whipped frantically over his security console. Captain, multiple unidentified vessels have just entered the solar system. The crew froze, all eyes turning to the main viewscreen. Jack's enhanced vision zoomed in on the distant objects, revealing sleek, predatory shapes unlike the Zenith's more exploratory design. Are they from your homeworld? Jack asked, a knot forming in his stomach. Lyra's biolite pulsed rapidly, a sign of her growing anxiety. No, these are different. I don't recognize the design. As if on cue, a transmission crackled through the ship's speakers. The language was alien, harsh and guttural, incomprehensible, even to the Zenith's advanced translators. They're broadcasting on all frequencies, Zin Oren reported, their antennae twitching nervously. Whatever they're saying, they want everyone to hear it. Jack's mind raced, processing the situation with inhuman speed. We need to warn Earth, if these ships are hostile, he didn't need to finish the thought. The implications were clear to everyone on the bridge. But how? Vera asked. If we reveal ourselves now, we risk causing panic, and we still don't know how Earth's governments will react to our presence. 
Jack closed his eyes, concentrating. Through his connection with the ship, he could sense the approaching vessels, feel the energy signatures of their weapons powering up. They were preparing for something big. His eyes snapped open. I have an idea. It's risky, but it might be our only chance. He turned to Lyra. Captain, I need your permission to broadcast a message using the Zenith's communications array. I can boost the signal using my connection to the ship. We can reach every major communications network on Earth simultaneously. Lyra hesitated, the weight of the decision evident in her flickering biolite. Jack, if we do this, there's no going back. We'll be exposing ourselves to the entire planet. I know, Jack nodded grimly. But if we don't, Earth will be caught completely off guard by whatever's coming. After a moment of tense silence, Lyra nodded. Do it. Jack placed his hands on the communications console, feeling the energy flow through him. He took a deep breath and began to speak. People of Earth, this is Dr. Jack Miller. I know this will sound incredible, but please listen carefully. I am currently aboard an alien spacecraft in orbit around our planet. We come in peace, but we are not alone. Multiple unidentified vessels have entered our solar system, and we believe they may pose a threat to Earth. He paused, knowing his next words would change the course of human history forever. I am working with a group of friendly aliens who want to help us. To prove I'm not some crackpot or prankster, I'm going to do something to demonstrate the reality of this situation. Jack concentrated, channeling energy through the Zenith systems. All across the globe, electronic devices flickered in a distinctive pattern, a clear sign of an external influence beyond Earth's current technology. That was just a small demonstration of what's possible when humans and aliens work together. Now, I need to speak urgently with Dr. Emma Davis of Cambridge University. Emma, if you're listening, you know me. You know I wouldn't do this if it wasn't of utmost importance. Please, contact us on this frequency. The fate of our world may depend on it. As Jack ended the transmission, the bridge of the zenith fell silent. The enormity of what they had just done hung heavy in the air. Suddenly, Zin's console lit up. Captain, we're receiving a response. From Earth's military commands, multiple countries are mobilizing their forces, and... We're picking up a transmission from Cambridge. It's Dr. Davis. Jack felt a glimmer of hope. They had made contact, but now the real challenge began. As Emma's voice came through the speakers, filled with a mix of shock, scientific curiosity, and determination, Jack knew that the next few hours would determine the fate of not just Earth, but potentially the entire galaxy. The unknown alien ships drew ever closer, their intentions still a mystery, and on the surface of the blue planet below, humanity grappled with the sudden, irrefutable proof that they were not alone in the universe. The stage was set for a confrontation that would shape the future of interstellar relations forever. The zenith shuddered as energy blasts from the rival alien ships impacted its shields. Jack stood at the helm, his hands splayed across the control panel, his consciousness intertwined with the ship's systems. He could feel every hit, every strain on the hull, as if it were his own body. Evasive maneuvers, Captain Lyra shouted, her biolite flashing rapidly with stress. Jack didn't need to be told twice. With a thought, he sent the zenith into a series of complex spirals and dives, avoiding the worst of the enemy fire. His enhanced reflexes and deep connection to the ship allowed him to push its capabilities beyond anything its original designers had imagined. We need to get to Emma, Jack said through gritted teeth, sweat beating on his forehead from the mental exertion. She's our best chance at preventing a global catastrophe. Lyra nodded grimly. Agreed. Kren, prepare for atmospheric entry. Pax, divert all non-essential power to shields and weapons. As the zenith plunged towards Earth, weaving through a barrage of enemy fire, Jack felt a new presence brush against his consciousness. Captain, he called out, I'm detecting a transmission from the lead enemy ship. It's, it's aimed at me. Before anyone could respond, a harsh, guttural voice filled Jack's mind. Human, your abilities are wasted on these weaklings. 
Join us, and we will unlock your true potential. Together, we can rule the galaxy. Jack's face hardened. Not interested, he muttered, reinforcing his mental defenses and severing the connection. The zenith broke through Earth's atmosphere in a blaze of fire, its hull glowing red hot from the friction. On the ground, chaos reigned. Military vehicles converged on Cambridge, while civilians fled in panic. There, Jack pointed to a figure standing alone on a rooftop, waving frantically. That's Emma. With precision that would have been impossible without Jack's interface, the zenith swooped low over the building. A tractor beam activated, gently lifting Emma Davis aboard just as a squadron of fighter jets roared past, missiles at the ready. As soon as Emma was safely inside, Jack sent the ship rocketing back toward space, pushing its engines to the limit. The enemy ships, caught off guard by the Zenith's unprecedented maneuverability, scrambled to regroup. Emma stumbled onto the bridge, her eyes wide with a mix of fear and awe. Jack, what in the world is going on? Are you controlling this ship? Long story, Jack replied, his focus split between piloting and fending off another mental attack from the enemy. What's the situation on Earth? Emma's expression turned grave. It's bad, Jack. After your broadcast, governments worldwide mobilized for war. They're convinced all aliens are hostile. Military leaders are calling for preemptive strikes against any extraterrestrial targets. Lyra's biolight dimmed with concern. This is exactly what we feared. If Earth attacks indiscriminately, it could spark an interstellar conflict. We need to show them we're not the enemy, Vera interjected. But how? Jack's mind raced, processing information at superhuman speeds. Emma, you're an expert in xenobiology. If we can prove that peaceful coexistence is possible, that our physiologies are compatible. Emma nodded, catching on quickly. A demonstration of symbiosis rather than conflict. It's a long shot, but it might work. Suddenly, the ship rocked violently. One of the enemy vessels had managed to score a direct hit. Shields at 30%, Pax reported, his tentacles working furiously over the controls. We can't take much more of this. Jack closed his eyes, reaching out with his enhanced senses. He could feel the enemy ships, the energy coursing through their systems. An idea struck him. Emma, I need you to trust me, he said, his eyes snapping open with newfound determination. I'm going to try something crazy. Before anyone could object, Jack immersed himself fully in the ship's systems. He reached out, not just to the zenith, but to the enemy vessels as well. For a moment, his consciousness expanded across space, touching every ship in the battle. With a surge of mental energy, Jack established a connection between all the vessels, alien and human minds alike. Suddenly, everyone the Zenith's crew, the enemy aliens, and the human military personnel watching from Earth could see through each other's eyes, feel each other's emotions. The effect was immediate and profound. The enemy ships ceased fire, their crews overwhelmed by the sudden influx of perspective and emotion. On Earth, military commanders stared in awe at the holographic displays showing the battle from the alien's point of view. Jack's voice, amplified by the power of the connected ships, echoed across the impromptu network. This is what's possible when we work together. We can understand each other, learn from each other. We don't have to fight. As the connection faded, Jack slumped in his chair, exhausted but triumphant. Emma rushed to his side, her scientific mind already racing with the implications of what she'd just experienced. The bridge of the zenith fell silent as everyone processed the momentous event. Lyra was the first to speak, her voice filled with a mix of awe and hope. Jack, Emma, I think you may have just prevented an interstellar war. But even as a fragile peace settled over the assembled ships, Jack knew their work was far from over. They had opened the door to understanding. But now came the hard part, building trust and forging a lasting alliance between humans and aliens. As Earth's military stood down and the enemy ships retreated, the real challenge began. Jack and Emma exchanged determined looks. They had a chance to shape the future of human-alien relations, and they weren't going to waste it. 
the journey towards a new era of interstellar cooperation had only just begun. The zenith orbited Earth, a silent sentinel as the planet below grappled with the reality of alien contact. Inside the ship's laboratory, Emma Davis and Zorik Vex worked tirelessly, their minds united in pursuit of a common goal. This is incredible, Emma muttered, peering into a microscope at a sample of alien tissue. The way your cells respond to atmospheric changes is unlike anything I've ever seen. Zorik's cranial ridges pulsed with excitement, and the adaptability of human DNA continues to astonish me. If we can combine these traits, their conversation was interrupted as Jack entered the lab, his enhanced senses immediately picking up on attention in the air. Any progress, he asked, hope tinging his voice. Emma straightened, a cautious smile on her face. We think we've cracked it, a temporary physiological alteration that could allow humans to survive in the alien's atmosphere and vice versa. Jack's eyes widened. That's amazing. How does it work? Zorik stepped forward, manipulating a holographic display. We've developed a nanite-based solution that can temporarily modify cellular structures. For humans, it reinforces cell walls to withstand the corrosive effects of our atmosphere. For us, it creates a buffer that processes Earth's oxygen more efficiently. The implications are enormous, Emma added. This could be the key to true cooperation between our species shared habitats, joint exploration missions. Jack nodded, his mind racing with possibilities, but his expression soon darkened. We need to move fast. The situation planetside is deteriorating. He activated a nearby screen, showing news feeds from Earth. Protests raged in major cities, with signs reading Earth for humans and no alien alliance. Military forces were mobilizing, and political leaders were making inflammatory speeches about the need to defend against extraterrestrial threats. It's not just Earth, Captain Lyra said, entering the lab. Her biolite eyes flickered with worry. We've intercepted transmissions from our homeworld. The hardliners are pushing for immediate action against Earth, arguing that humans are too dangerous to be left unchecked. The weight of the situation settled heavily on the room. They had made a breakthrough. But would it be enough to prevent an interstellar war? Jack's enhanced mind worked overtime, formulating a plan. We need a demonstration, something so undeniable that even the hardliners can't ignore it. Emma's eyes lit up. What if we show them a joint mission, humans and aliens working together in each other's environments? That could work, Lyra nodded. But where, and how do we ensure both sides will even pay attention? Jack paced the lab, his connection to the ship feeding him data at an incredible rate. Suddenly, he stopped. Mars. We go to Mars. The others looked at him in confusion. Zorik spoke up. Mars? But it's uninhabited, and... Exactly, Jack interrupted. It's neutral ground. And more importantly, both Earth and your homeworld have expressed interest in colonizing it. What if we show them that together? We could terraform Mars faster and more efficiently than either species could alone. The idea hung in the air for a moment before Emma broke into a grin. Jack, that's brilliant. A joint terraforming mission would demonstrate the benefits of cooperation on a massive scale. Lyra's biolite pulsed with renewed hope. I'll contact our homeworld, if we can get them to agree to a joint demonstration. I'll reach out to Earth's space agencies, Emma added. They might be more receptive than the military or political leaders. As the others rushed to put the plan into motion, Jack turned to Zorik. How quickly can you produce enough of the nanite solution for a small team? Zorik's cranial ridges rippled with concentration. With the Zenith's resources, I can have it ready in a few hours. But Jack, are you sure about this? The risks? are nothing compared to the risk of war, Jack finished. He placed a hand on Zorik's shoulder, a gesture of trust between human and alien. We can do this. We have to. Over the next few hours, the zenith became a hive of activity. Emma coordinated with Earth's scientific community, leveraging her reputation to gain support. Lyra engaged in tense negotiations with her homeworld, 
emphasizing the potential benefits of cooperation, Zorik and his team worked feverishly to produce the Nanite solution, while Jack used his enhanced abilities to optimize the ship's systems for the journey to Mars. As the deadline approached, Jack stood on the bridge, watching Earth recede in the viewscreen. A small team of human scientists had agreed to join them, along with representatives from Lyra's homeworld. It was a fragile coalition, but it was a start. Course set for Mars, Cran announced their tentacles dancing over the controls. Jack took a deep breath, feeling the weight of two worlds on his shoulders. Let's make history, he said, his voice filled with determination. As the zenith accelerated towards the red planet, Jack knew that the next few days would determine the fate of human-alien relations for generations to come. The journey to Mars was more than a scientific mission. It was a race against time to prove that cooperation was not just possible, but essential for the future of both species. With Earth and the alien homeworld watching closely, Jack, Emma, and their unlikely allies prepared to take the first steps towards a new era of interstellar collaboration. The red sands of Mars awaited, ready to become the testing ground for a partnership that could change the course of galactic history. The Martian landscape stretched out before them, a vast expanse of rust-colored sand and rocky outcrops, the zenith had landed near the base of Olympus Mons, its sleek form a stark contrast to the ancient terrain. Jack stood at the foot of the ship's ramp, his enhanced senses taking in every detail of the alien world. It's time, he said, turning to the mixed group of humans and aliens behind him. Let's show them what we can do together. As the team began setting up their equipment, Jack's mind raced. The eyes of two worlds were upon them, and the stakes couldn't be higher but something nagged at the back of his mind, a sense that not everything was as it seemed. Emma approached, her excitement barely contained. The nanite solution is ready. We'll start with small environmental samples before moving on to personal demonstrations. Jack nodded, but his expression remained troubled. Emma noticed immediately. What's wrong? I'm not sure, he admitted. Something feels off. I've been monitoring communications between Earth and the alien homeworld, and there are patterns I can't quite explain. Before Emma could respond, Zorik called them over. We're ready to begin the first test. The demonstration proceeded smoothly at first. They successfully altered the atmosphere inside a sealed chamber, allowing both species to breathe comfortably. The data streamed back to Earth and the alien homeworld drawing cautious praise from scientists on both sides. But as they prepared for the personal demonstrations, Jack's unease grew. He excused himself, retreating to the Zenith's communication hub. Using his enhanced abilities, he dove deep into the data streams, searching for the source of his suspicion. What he found chilled him to the core. Racing back to the team, Jack pulled Emma, Lyra, and Zorik aside. We have a problem, he said his voice low and urgent. I've uncovered evidence of a conspiracy. There are extremist factions on both sides working together to sabotage this demonstration. Lyra's biolite flickered with alarm. Are you certain? Jack nodded grimly. They've infiltrated both our teams. Their plan is to alter the nanite solution, making it appear that the technology is dangerous and unreliable. They want to provoke a conflict. Emma's face paled. But why? What could they possibly gain from war? Power, Zorik said, his cranial ridges pulsing with agitation. Fear? Control. There are always those who profit from conflict. We need to expose them, Lyra declared. But how? If we make accusations without proof, we could spark the very conflict we're trying to prevent. Jack's mind worked at superhuman speed formulating a plan. We use their own plan against them. We go ahead with the personal demonstrations, but we switch the solutions. We'll use the unaltered nanites ourselves, while giving the sabotaged batch to the conspirators. Emma's eyes widened. That's incredibly risky, Jack, if we're wrong about who's involved. We don't have a choice, Jack insisted. It's the only way to expose them without risking innocent lives. As the others reluctantly agreed, Jack set his plan in motion. 
Using his connection to the ship's systems, he subtly altered the distribution of the nanite solutions. Then, with hearts pounding, they proceeded with the demonstration. Jack, Emma, Lyra, and Zorik stepped into the alien atmosphere chamber first, their bodies adapting seamlessly thanks to the genuine nanites. The watching audiences on both worlds held their breath as the chamber filled with the corrosive alien air. We're fine, Jack announced, his voice broadcast across the galaxy. The technology works. Our two species can coexist safely. As relief washed over the faces of millions watching the broadcast, the conspirators made their move. A group of three humans and two aliens stepped forward, volunteering for the next demonstration. Jack watched them closely, his enhanced senses picking up on their nervous energy. The chamber filled once again with alien atmosphere. At first, nothing seemed amiss. Then, suddenly, the conspirators began to cough and gasp, their bodies reacting violently to the air. Stop the demonstration, one of them shouted. The technology is flawed. This is too dangerous. But Jack was ready. With lightning speed, he accessed the chamber systems, displaying the vital signs of all participants on screens visible to the watching worlds. The contrast was clear while Jack and his allies were perfectly fine. The conspirators were showing signs of deliberate sabotage. These individuals, Jack announced, his voice ringing with authority, have attempted to sabotage our efforts at peace. They altered their own nanite solutions in an attempt to provoke conflict between our species. The revelation sent shockwaves through both Earth and the alien homeworld. As security forces moved in to apprehend the conspirators, Jack continued, but their plan has failed. We've shown today that not only can our species coexist, but we can also overcome those who would drive us apart. As the dust settled, Jack looked out over the Martian landscape a symbol of the new frontier that humans and aliens could explore together. The path forward wouldn't be easy, but they had taken the first crucial steps. Emma placed a hand on his shoulder. You did it, Jack. You've given us a chance at real peace. Jack smiled, feeling the weight of two worlds on his shoulders, but also the hope of a united future. We did it, he corrected, all of us, together, and this is just the beginning. As news of the foiled conspiracy spread, the tide of public opinion began to turn. The demonstration on Mars had shown not just the potential for cooperation, but the shared values of truth and justice that could bind two species together. The journey towards lasting peace had truly begun, on the red sands of an alien world that might one day be home to both humans and aliens alike. The aftermath of the Mars demonstration buzzed with activity, as the Zenith made its way back to Earth, carrying its mixed crew of humans and aliens, the galactic political landscape was shifting beneath their feet. Jack stood on the bridge, his enhanced senses attuned to the myriad of transmissions flooding in from both Earth and the alien homeworld. Suddenly, Zorik burst onto the bridge, his cranial ridges pulsing with an intensity Jack had never seen before. Captain, Jack, you need to see this immediately. Lyra and Jack exchanged worried glances before following Zorik to the medical bay. There, displayed on a large holographic screen, were two sets of alien DNA sequences, one clearly degraded, the other vibrant and whole. What are we looking at? Zorik, Lyra asked, her biolite eyes flickering rapidly. Zorik's voice trembled with excitement and disbelief. The degraded sequence is a baseline sample from our species, the restored one. It's from the aliens who were exposed to Earth's atmosphere during the demonstration. Emma, who had been quietly analyzing the data in the corner, stepped forward. It's not just restored, she added, her scientific curiosity overriding her shock. The Earth-exposed sample shows signs of enhanced resilience and adaptability. It's as if... As if Earth's atmosphere is healing us, Lyra finished, her voice barely a whisper. The implications hung heavy in the air. Jack's mind raced, processing the potential consequences at superhuman speed. This changes everything, he said finally. The balance of power, the future of human-alien relations. Before anyone could respond, alarms blared throughout the ship. Kren's voice came over the intercom, urgent and strained. 
Captain, we're receiving priority transmissions from both Earth's governments and our homeworld. They're, they're demanding we return immediately. As they rushed back to the bridge, Jack could feel the tension mounting. The news of Earth's healing properties for the aliens had clearly spread faster than they'd anticipated. Lyra took her place at the command chair, her posture rigid with stress. On screen, she ordered. The view screen split, showing the stern faces of both human and alien leaders. The alien high commander spoke first, his tone leaving no room for argument. Captain Knox, you are ordered to return to the homeworld immediately. The humans on board are to be detained for further study. Jack felt a chill run down his spine. He glanced at Emma, seeing his own fear reflected in her eyes. The human representative, a stern-faced woman Jack recognized as the Unsecretary General, countered quickly. Absolutely not. The Zenith and all its occupants will land at the designated secure facility on Earth. This is not negotiable. As the leaders argued, Jack's enhanced mind was working overtime, analyzing every nuance, every subtle shift in tone and body language. He leaned in close to Lyra, speaking softly. They're both scared. The aliens fear losing control of this discovery, and humans fear being overrun or exploited. Lyra nodded almost imperceptibly. What do you suggest? Jack took a deep breath, knowing his next words could shape the future of two worlds. We need to take control of the narrative. Neither side has the full picture, and they're both acting out of fear and self-interest. With a subtle gesture from Lyra, Jack stepped forward, addressing both screens. Leaders of Earth and the alien homeworld, please hear me out. What we've discovered isn't a weapon or a bargaining chip, it's an opportunity. An opportunity for true symbiosis between our species. He paused, letting his words sink in. Earth's atmosphere isn't just healing the aliens, it's enhancing them. And in turn, their technology and knowledge could help us solve some of our greatest challenges. We don't need to fight over this. We can work together, find a way to share these benefits equally. The leaders fell silent, clearly taken aback by Jack's bold intervention. Emma stepped up beside him, adding her scientific authority to his words. We've only scratched the surface of what's possible. With cooperative research, we could unlock potential we've never dreamed of for both species. For a tense moment, no one spoke. Then, slowly, the alien high commander's stern expression softened. Perhaps, perhaps we have been too hasty. A joint research initiative could be arranged, under strict controls. The Unsecretary General nodded cautiously. We would be open to discussions, provided all parties agree to full transparency and equal sharing of discoveries. As the leaders began to negotiate tentative terms, Jack felt a wave of relief wash over him. They had averted an immediate crisis, but he knew the real work was just beginning. Lyra approached him, her biolite pulsing with a mix of emotions. You've given us a chance, Jack, but the road ahead won't be easy. There will be those on both sides who resist this change, who see it as a threat to their power or way of life. Jack nodded, his expression determined. I know, but for the first time, we have a real shot at building something incredible together, a true interstellar community. As the Zenith continued its journey back to Earth, Jack gazed out at the stars. The universe had just become a whole lot bigger, and humanity's place in it far more complex. But with challenge came opportunity, and Jack was ready to face whatever came next not just as a human, but as a bridge between two species on the brink of an extraordinary new era. The future was unwritten, but for the first time, it seemed bright with a promise of cooperation rather than conflict. As Earth grew larger in the viewscreen, Jack knew that the real adventure was only just beginning. The Zenith touched down on a specially prepared landing pad outside Geneva, Switzerland. As Jack, Emma, and the alien crew disembarked, they were greeted by a sea of faces human diplomats, scientists, and military personnel mingled with a growing number of alien representatives. Zin Oren, the newly appointed alien diplomat, stepped forward to address the crowd. Their antennae twitched nervously as they spoke. 
we come seeking cooperation and mutual benefit. The discovery of Earth's healing properties for our kind is a miracle, but one we must approach with wisdom and restraint. Jack scanned the crowd with his enhanced senses, picking up on undercurrents of tension and fear. He leaned in close to Emma. This is a powder keg waiting to explode. We need to act fast. Over the next few weeks, Jack, Emma, and Zinn worked tirelessly to manage the growing crisis. They set up screening centers for alien refugees, established quarantine protocols, and coordinated with Earth's governments to handle the logistical nightmare of an interstellar immigration wave. But as they worked, Jack's enhanced abilities picked up on troubling patterns, whispered conversations, encrypted transmissions, movements that didn't quite add up. He shared his concerns with Emma and Zinn during a late-night strategy session. I think there's something bigger going on, Jack said, his voice low. Some of the aliens aren't just here for healing. They're studying the planet in ways that go beyond scientific curiosity. Emma's brow furrowed. What are you suggesting? Zinn's antennae drooped. I... I've heard rumors. Whispers among some of the more radical factions. They speak of... Reshaping Earth. The implications hit Jack like a thunderbolt. Terraforming, he breathed. They want to make Earth more like their homeworld. But that would be catastrophic for humans, Emma gasped. Our entire ecosystem would collapse. Zinn nodded grimly. For some, it's seen as the ultimate solution. A way to save our species entirely, not just treat the symptoms. Jack's mind raced, processing the information at superhuman speed. We need proof, and we need to find a way to stop this without triggering a war that would devastate both our species. They spent the next few days gathering evidence, carefully probing the alien networks without raising suspicion. Jack's ability to interface with technology proved invaluable, allowing him to access encrypted files and communications. What they uncovered was chilling. A well-organized group of alien extremists had already begun the early stages of terraforming, introducing microscopic organisms into Earth's atmosphere and oceans that would, over time, alter the planet's composition. We need to act now, Jack said, reviewing the data with Emma and Zinn. But if we go public with this, it could shatter the fragile peace we've built. Emma paced the room, her scientific mind working overtime. What if? What if we could offer an alternative, something that would satisfy both species' needs without destroying either world? Zinn's antennae perked up. What do you have in mind? A compromise, Emma explained, her eyes shining with inspiration. We use the aliens' terraforming technology, combined with our understanding of Earth's healing properties, to create controlled environments, biodomes where aliens can live and heal, without altering the entire planet. Jack nodded slowly, seeing the potential. And we could use similar technology to create habitable areas on the alien homeworld for humans. True coexistence on both planets. They worked feverishly to develop the plan, knowing they were in a race against time. Jack used his enhanced abilities to design the biodomes, integrating alien and human technology in ways never before imagined. When they were ready, they called a joint session of human and alien leaders. The atmosphere was tense as Jack stepped forward to address the assembly. We've uncovered a plot, he began, his voice steady. A plan by certain factions to terraform Earth, which would be catastrophic for humanity. The room erupted in shouts and accusations. Jack held up his hands, calling for calm. But we're not here to cast blame. We're here to offer a solution, a way forward that benefits both our species. As Emma and Zinn presented their plan for the biodomes and shared habitats, Jack could sense the mood in the room shifting. Hope began to replace fear and anger. This is our chance, Jack concluded, to show that we can overcome our differences, that we can find solutions that don't require the destruction of either world. The debate that followed was intense. But as the hours wore on, a consensus began to emerge. The terraforming plot was exposed and its architects brought to justice. In its place, a new initiative was born Project Harmony, 
a joint human-alien effort to create shared spaces on both Earth and the alien homeworld. As Jack looked out over the assembly, seeing humans and aliens coming together in a spirit of cooperation, he felt a profound sense of hope. The road ahead would be challenging, but they had taken the first steps towards a truly integrated interstellar society. Emma squeezed his hand, her eyes shining with pride and determination. We did it, Jack. We found a way. Jack nodded, knowing that this was just the beginning. As an enhanced human, he now stood at the forefront of a new era, a bridge between two worlds, helping to shape a future where the stars themselves were no longer the limit. As Project Harmony began to take shape, Jack found himself at the center of a whirlwind of activity. Biodome prototypes were being constructed, diplomatic channels were buzzing with negotiations, and scientists from both species were collaborating on groundbreaking research. But amidst the progress, Jack sensed an undercurrent of tension that he couldn't quite place. It was during a joint planning session that Jack's world shifted once again. As he stood listening to a heated debate between human and alien engineers, he suddenly heard voices not with his ears, but directly in his mind. Fragments of thoughts, flashes of emotion, all swirling together in a cacophony of mental noise. Overwhelmed, Jack stumbled out of the room, finding a quiet corner to collect himself. Emma followed, concern etched on her face. Jack, what's wrong? He looked up at her, his eyes wide with a mix of wonder and fear. I, I can hear them. Emma, all of them, their thoughts, their feelings, it's like I'm connected to everyone. As Jack learned to control this new ability, he realized its potential. He could bridge the gap between species in ways never before possible, sensing misunderstandings before they escalated and fostering genuine empathy between humans and aliens. But with this gift came a terrible revelation. As Jack sifted through the sea of thoughts surrounding him, he caught glimpses of a darker plan, one that went far beyond the initial terraforming plot they had uncovered. It's Pax Kyle, Jack whispered to Emma and Zinn during an emergency meeting. He's the one behind it all. The terraforming, the refugee crisis, it's all part of a bigger scheme. Zinn's antennae quivered with shock. Pax Kyle? But he's one of the most respected industrialists in our society. He's been a vocal supporter of interspecies cooperation. It's a front, Jack explained, his voice tight with urgency. He's playing both sides. I've seen his true thoughts. He doesn't want cooperation, he wants domination. The terraforming plan was just the beginning. He's manipulating events to trigger a war, one that he thinks his side can win. Emma's face paled. But why? What could he possibly gain from this? Power, Jack said grimly. Control over two worlds and all the resources that come with them. He sees the healing properties of Earth, as the key to elevating his species above all others in the galaxy. The trio spent the next few days carefully gathering evidence, using Jack's telepathic abilities to navigate the complex web of Pax Kyle's operations without alerting him to their investigation. What they uncovered was staggering a vast network of corrupt officials, hidden weapons caches, and sophisticated propaganda campaigns designed to inflame tensions between humans and aliens. We need to expose him, Zinn said, their usual diplomatic calm replaced by fierce determination. But if we're not careful, the revelation could spark the very conflict we're trying to prevent. Jack nodded, his enhanced mind working overtime to formulate a plan. We need to turn his own strategy against him, use the connections he's built to unravel his entire operation. They set their plan in motion carefully leaking information to key figures on both sides. Jack used his telepathic abilities to nudge conversations in the right direction, planting seeds of doubt about Pax Kyle's true motives. As suspicion grew, Pax Kyle became increasingly paranoid. Jack could sense the industrialists mounting fear and desperation. It all came to a head during a crucial summit between human and alien leaders. As Pax Kyle rose to address the assembly, Jack made his move. Concentrating with all his might, he established a telepathic link between every being in the room human and alien alike. You all need to see the truth, Jack said, 
his voice resonating in the minds of all present. The threat we face isn't from each other, it's from those who would manipulate us for their own gain. In a flood of shared consciousness, Jack revealed everything Pax Kyle's plots, his hidden motives, the elaborate deceptions he had woven. The assembly watched in stunned silence as the evidence unfolded before them, irrefutable and damning. Pax Kyle, realizing he had been exposed, attempted to flee. But with both humans and aliens united against him, there was nowhere to run. He was quickly apprehended, his vast network of conspirators unraveling in the wake of his fall. As the dust settled, Jack found himself at the center of a profound shift in human-alien relations. The shared mental experience had fostered a deep understanding between the species, breaking down barriers that had seemed insurmountable just days before. Emma approached Jack, her eyes shining with a mix of awe and pride. You did it, Jack. You've given us a chance at real peace. But Jack shook his head, a small smile on his face. No, we did it. All of us, together. This is just the beginning. As leaders from both species came together to chart a new course forward, Jack realized that his journey was far from over. His evolving abilities had made him a bridge between worlds, a catalyst for a new era of interstellar cooperation. The path ahead was uncertain, filled with challenges they had yet to imagine. But as Jack looked out at the diverse assembly of humans and aliens, now united in purpose, he felt a surge of hope. Together, they had taken the first steps towards a future where the boundaries between species faded and the true potential of their united civilizations could finally be realized. The aftermath of Pax Kyle's exposure brought a newfound unity between humans and aliens, but the celebration was short-lived as Jack sifted through the vast network of information his telepathic abilities now gave him access to, he sensed a growing undercurrent of concern among both species. During a routine check of the biodomes, Emma noticed something alarming. Jack, look at these readings, she said, her voice tight with worry. The composition of Earth's atmosphere inside the domes, it's changing. Jack focused his enhanced senses on the data, his heart sinking as he processed the implications. It's not just in the domes, he realized. It's happening everywhere. They quickly convened an emergency meeting with Zinn and key scientists from both species. The evidence was undeniable. Earth's atmosphere was shifting, becoming more like the aliens' homeworld due to accelerated pollution and climate change. This is catastrophic, Zinn said, their antennae drooping. Not only is it a threat to humanity, but it's also reducing the healing properties that drew our people here in the first place. Jack could sense the rising panic in the room, a mixture of fear and guilt from both humans and aliens. He took a deep breath, centering himself amidst the swirling emotions. We need to approach this systematically, he said, his voice calm but firm. First, we need to understand exactly what's causing these changes, and how quickly they're progressing. Emma nodded, already pulling up holographic models of Earth's atmospheric layers. We'll need to combine our climate science with the aliens' advanced atmospheric manipulation technology. If we can model the changes accurately, we might be able to find a way to reverse them. Over the next few weeks, Jack, Emma, and Zinn led a global effort to address the crisis. Human climate scientists worked alongside alien atmospheric experts, sharing knowledge and technology in ways that would have been unimaginable just months ago. Jack's telepathic abilities proved invaluable, allowing him to bridge communication gaps and foster genuine collaboration between the species. But as they delved deeper into the problem, the magnitude of the challenge became clear. The changes are happening faster than we thought, Emma reported during a tense briefing. At this rate, Earth's atmosphere will be uninhabitable for humans within a decade, and its healing properties for the aliens will be gone even sooner. The room fell silent, the weight of the situation settling heavily on everyone present. Jack could sense the despair threatening to overwhelm both humans and aliens alike. But then, in the midst of the gloomy thoughts, Jack caught a glimmer of an idea. It started as a faint impression from one of the alien scientists. But as Jack focused on it, the concept began to take shape. Wait, he said, 
his eyes lighting up with sudden inspiration. What if we're looking at this all wrong? We've been trying to figure out how to reverse the damage, but what if we could use it to our advantage instead? Emma looked at him, confusion clear on her face. What do you mean? Jack began to pace, his enhanced mind racing ahead as he explained. The alien's technology for atmospheric manipulation, it was originally designed to terraform planets, right? To make them more like their homeworld. Zinn nodded, their antennae perking up with interest. Yes, that's correct. So what if, Jack continued, his excitement growing? Instead of trying to turn back the clock on Earth's atmosphere, we find a way to stabilize it at a point that's beneficial for both species. The idea hung in the air for a moment before Emma gasped, catching on. A middle ground, an atmosphere that's breathable for humans but still retains the healing properties for the aliens. The room burst into activity as scientists from both species began to explore the possibility. Jack used his telepathic abilities to facilitate the exchange of ideas, helping to break down complex concepts across the language barrier. As the work progressed, a new plan began to take shape. By combining the alien's atmospheric manipulation technology with cutting-edge human climate science, they could potentially guide Earth's changing atmosphere to a new equilibrium, one that would support both species. But the challenge was immense. They would need to act on a global scale, carefully balancing the needs of both humans and aliens, while dealing with the political and economic ramifications of such a massive undertaking. This won't be easy, Jack addressed the assembled team, his voice resolute. We're not just talking about changing our planet's atmosphere, we're talking about changing the way both our species live and interact with our environment. It's going to require sacrifice and cooperation on a scale we've never seen before. Emma stepped up beside him, her expression determined. But if we succeed, we'll have created something unprecedented, a truly shared world, where both our species can thrive together. Zin joined them, representing the hopes of their people. This is a chance to right the wrongs of the past and build a future that neither of our species could have achieved alone. As the team dispersed to begin the monumental task ahead, Jack felt a mix of hope and trepidation. The path forward was uncertain, filled with challenges they had yet to fully comprehend. But as he looked at the diverse group of humans and aliens working side by side, he knew they had a fighting chance. The journey to save Earth and create a shared future for both species had begun, and Jack, with his unique abilities and perspective, would be at the forefront helping to guide humanity and their new alien allies into an era of unprecedented cooperation and mutual survival. Jack stood before a holographic display of Earth, its atmosphere represented by swirling layers of color. As he manipulated the image with his mind, adjusting variables and running simulations, an idea began to take shape. Emma, Zin, he called out, excitement building in his voice. I think I've got something. As his colleagues gathered around, Jack explained his vision. We've been thinking too small. Trying to fix the atmosphere from the ground up is like trying to change the course of a river with our bare hands. But what if we could influence it from above? He expanded the hologram, revealing a network of satellites encircling the planet. We combine the alien's atmospheric manipulation technology with a global satellite system. Each satellite would act as a node in a planet-wide environmental control network. Emma's eyes widened as she grasped the implications. A planetary-scale air purification system. Exactly, Jack nodded. But it's more than that. These satellites wouldn't just clean the air. They'd help us fine-tune the atmospheric composition, finding that perfect balance between human habitability and alien healing properties. Zinn's antennae quivered with excitement. This, this could work. Our atmospheric processors, miniaturized and adapted for orbital deployment. It's ambitious, but not impossible. As they delved into the details, the magnitude of the project became clear. It would require resources and cooperation on an unprecedented scale. Every nation on Earth would need to be involved, along with the full support of the alien civilization. The technical challenges are enormous, Emma mused, 
but the political ones might be even bigger. How do we convince everyone to work together on something this massive? Jack's expression turned serious. We show them the truth, all of it. Over the next few days, Jack worked tirelessly, using his telepathic abilities to compile a comprehensive report on Earth's atmospheric crisis. He gathered data from scientists of both species, weaving together a narrative that was both scientifically rigorous and emotionally compelling. When it was ready, he called for a global summit. Leaders from every nation on Earth gathered alongside alien representatives. The tension in the room was palpable as Jack stepped up to address them. What I'm about to show you isn't easy to watch, he began, but it's something we all need to see. With that, he unleashed a carefully controlled telepathic broadcast. Every being in the room, human and alien alike, was suddenly immersed in a visceral, first-hand experience of Earth's environmental decline. They felt the struggle of plants and animals adapting to rapidly changing conditions. They witnessed the gradual loss of the atmosphere's healing properties, and they saw, with stark clarity, the bleak future that awaited both species if nothing was done. As the vision faded, the room was silent. Jack could sense the shock and dismay radiating from every mind present. But beneath that, he felt something else growing a collective determination. Now that you've seen what we're facing, Jack continued, his voice steady, let me show you what we can do about it. He laid out the satellite plan in detail, explaining how it could not only save the planet, but usher in a new era of environmental stewardship and interspecies cooperation. The debate that followed was intense. There were concerns about sovereignty, about the sharing of advanced technology, about the economic impacts of such a massive undertaking. But as the hours wore on, a consensus began to emerge. The threat was too great and the potential benefits too significant to ignore. One by one, world leaders and alien representatives pledged their support. Resources were committed, treaties were drawn up, and task forces were assembled. Project Skynet, as it came to be called, was given the green light. The next few months were a whirlwind of activity. Jack found himself at the center of it all, his unique abilities making him the ideal coordinator for this unprecedented global effort. He worked tirelessly, bridging communication gaps, resolving conflicts, and pushing the boundaries of what was thought possible. Emma led the scientific team, integrating human and alien technologies in ways that were revolutionizing multiple fields. Zinn became the diplomatic face of the project, skillfully navigating the complex political landscape. As the first satellites were launched into orbit, Jack stood with Emma and Zinn at mission control watching the holographic display of Earth. Tiny points of light began to appear around the planet, each representing a node in the growing network. It's really happening, Emma breathed, her voice filled with awe. Zinn nodded, their antennae swaying gently. A shared endeavor for a shared world. Jack smiled, feeling the weight of the moment. This is just the beginning, he said. We're not just saving our planet. We're learning how to be true custodians of our world, together. As more satellites joined the network, the first data started streaming in. Early results were promising subtle, but measurable improvements in air quality were already being detected. But Jack knew the road ahead was long. Cleaning Earth's atmosphere and finding the perfect balance would take years, perhaps decades. There would be setbacks, unforeseen challenges, and moments of doubt. Yet as he looked at the growing network of lights surrounding the holographic Earth, Jack felt a profound sense of hope. Humans and aliens, once separated by vast gulfs of space and understanding, were now united in a common cause. They were writing a new chapter in the history of both their species one of cooperation, innovation, and shared stewardship of their adopted home. The future was uncertain, but for the first time in a long while, it looked bright, as the points of light continued to multiply around the blue marble of Earth, Jack knew that they had taken the first crucial steps towards not just survival, but a true interstellar civilization. The first wave of Project Skynet satellites had just achieved stable orbit when the alarms blared across every command center on Earth. Jack's enhanced senses immediately picked up on the surge of panic and confusion rippling through both human and alien minds. 
multiple unidentified vessels entering Earth's atmosphere. Zin's voice crackled over the comms. They're not responding to hails. Jack's mind raced, instantly connecting to the Global Defense Network. Through his telepathic link, he could see the incoming threat a fleet of sleek, predatory ships unlike anything they'd encountered before. It's Pax Kyle, Jack announced grimly. I can sense his presence. He's making his final move. Emma rushed to his side, her face pale but determined. How? We thought he was contained. He must have had contingencies we didn't uncover, Jack replied, already formulating a plan. Zin, alert all Earth Defense Forces and our alien allies. We need every ship we can muster. As the planet's defenses scrambled to respond, Jack reached out with his mind, connecting with key military and alien leaders. Listen carefully, he projected. We need to coordinate our efforts. Humans, focus on protecting the ground-based installations. Alien ships, you're our best bet for engaging Pax Kyle's forces in orbit. Through his enhanced perception, Jack could see the battle unfolding like a complex, three-dimensional chess game. Pax Kyle's ships were technologically advanced, but they were up against the combined might and desperation of two species fighting for their shared home. Jack, the Skynet satellites, Emma's voice cut through his concentration. If Pax Kyle destroys them, we lose our best chance at saving the atmosphere. Jack nodded, his decision made. I'm going up there. I can interface with the satellites, use them as a weapon against Pax Kyle's fleet. Before anyone could object, Jack was moving. He sprinted to a nearby hangar where a prototype ship, a hybrid of human and alien technology awaited. As he strapped himself in, he felt the vessel respond to his thoughts, systems coming online with a mere mental command. The ship shot into the sky, Jack's enhanced reflexes allowing him to navigate through the chaos of battle with impossible precision. As he approached the satellite network, he reached out with his mind, connecting to each node. Suddenly, Jack's consciousness expanded across the entire network. He could see the whole of Earth below feel the ebb and flow of its damaged atmosphere, and he could sense Pax Kyle's ships, their energy signatures standing out like beacons against the void. With a thought, Jack repurposed the satellite's atmospheric manipulation technology. Concentrated beams of energy lanced out, striking Pax Kyle's vessels with pinpoint accuracy. Ships began to fall from the sky, their systems overloaded by the unexpected assault but Pax Kyle was not so easily defeated. Jack sensed a massive energy buildup in the industrialist flagship. He's going to try to take out the whole network with one shot, Jack warned through his telepathic link. In that moment, Jack made a decision that would change the course of the battle and possibly the fate of both species. He opened his mind fully, not just to his allies, but to every being involved in the conflict, including Pax Kyle and his forces. A flood of shared consciousness swept across the battlefield. Every individual, human and alien alike, suddenly experienced the hopes, fears, and determination of their allies and enemies. They felt the desperation of Pax Kyle, the terror of Earth's population, the fierce protectiveness of the defenders. Most importantly, they all glimpsed the potential future that Jack and his team had been working towards a healed Earth a true partnership between species, a stepping stone to the stars. The effect was immediate and profound. Confusion rippled through Pax Kyle's forces as many lowered their weapons, suddenly uncertain of their cause. Pax Kyle himself faltered, his flagship's weapon powering down as doubt clouded his mind. Seizing the moment, Jack directed the full power of the satellite network towards Pax Kyle's ship. A blinding beam of energy engulfed the vessel, shorting out its systems and leaving it dead in space. As the dust settled and the remaining enemy forces surrendered, Jack guided his ship back to Earth, exhausted but triumphant. He landed to find Emma, Zinn, and a crowd of humans and aliens waiting, their faces a mix of awe and relief. It's over, Jack said simply as he stepped from his ship. Pax Kyle is defeated. The celebration that followed was unlike anything Earth had ever seen a true interspecies expression of joy and shared victory. But as the initial euphoria faded, 
The reality of the work still ahead set in. We've won the battle, Emma said, her voice tinged with both hope and caution. But saving our world, that's the real challenge ahead. Jack nodded, looking up at the sky where the Skynet satellites continued their silent vigil. True? But for the first time, we're truly in this together. Two species, one future. As the sun set on a day that would be remembered in the histories of both civilizations, Jack knew that their journey was far from over. The road to healing Earth and forging a lasting interstellar partnership would be long and fraught with challenges. But as he stood there, surrounded by humans and aliens united in purpose, Jack felt a profound sense of hope. They had faced extinction and emerged stronger, more united. Whatever the future held, they would face it together as one people, with two worlds to call home. As the battle raged around him, Jack felt a surge of energy unlike anything he had experienced before. His consciousness expanded, not just connecting with the satellite network and the minds of those around him, but reaching into the very fabric of space-time itself. In that moment of transcendence, Jack saw the intricate web of connections between all living things, human and alien alike. With this newfound awareness came an influx of knowledge and abilities. Jack could now manipulate energy fields at will, altering the very physics of the battlefield. He created force fields to protect allied ships, redirected enemy fire with a thought, and even opened small, localized wormholes to transport friendly forces across vast distances in an instant. As he wielded these godlike powers, Jack realized that he had become something entirely new, a true hybrid of human and alien, embodying the highest potential of both species' evolution. He was the living proof of what their cooperation could achieve. But with this realization came a profound understanding. Victory through force alone would never bring lasting peace. Even as he effortlessly thwarted Pax Kyle's attacks, Jack knew that a more fundamental change was needed. In a moment of clarity, Jack ceased his offensive. Instead, he reached out with his mind, enveloping the entire battlefield, every human, every alien, friend and foe alike in a shared consciousness. Look, Jack projected, his thoughts resonating in the minds of all present. See what we can become together. He showed them visions of the future, not just the restored Earth, but the countless worlds beyond. He revealed the mysteries of the universe that could be unlocked through their combined knowledge and the challenges they could overcome together. Most importantly, he showed them the beauty of their differences and how those very differences, when united in common purpose, created something greater than the sum of its parts. The effect was immediate and profound. The battle came to a standstill as every being, from the lowliest foot soldier to Pax Kyle himself, was overcome by the sheer magnitude of what they were witnessing. Jack felt the shift in consciousness ripple through the collective mind. Doubt, fear, and aggression gave way to wonder, hope, and a burning desire for unity. Even Pax Kyle, his mind laid bare in this shared experience, began to see the folly of his actions and the potential for a future far grander than his schemes of domination. As Jack gently withdrew from the collective consciousness, allowing each individual to process what they had experienced, he found himself floating in space, his physical form now a swirling mass of energy bridging human and alien physiologies. Emma's voice crackled over the calm, filled with awe and concern. Jack, are you? What happened to you? Jack smiled, his voice resonating not just through the communication systems, but in the minds of all present. I've become what we all can be, Emma, the next step in our shared evolution. He turned his attention to the assembled forces, his voice carrying across the battlefield. The fighting ends now. We stand at a crossroads a moment that will define not just our two species, but the future of life in this galaxy. We can choose conflict and mutual destruction, or we can embrace a future of cooperation and boundless potential. Jack paused, letting his words sink in. He could sense the turmoil in the minds around him, the struggle between old fears and new possibilities. I stand before you as living proof of what we can achieve together, he continued. Neither fully human nor alien, but something new a bridge between our kinds. Each of us has something unique to offer, strengths that complement the other's weaknesses, 
apart, we face extinction. Together, we can reach the stars. As Jack spoke, he began to manipulate the energy around him, creating a dazzling display of light and color. He showed them the damaged atmosphere of Earth then demonstrated how the combined efforts of human innovation and alien technology could heal it. He revealed glimpses of future cities where humans and aliens lived side by side, of starships crewed by both species exploring the farthest reaches of the galaxy. The choice is yours, Jack concluded, his form slowly returning to a more recognizable human shape. But know this, the path of unity is not the easy one. It will require us to challenge our deepest assumptions, to overcome millennia of isolation and fear. Yet it is the only path that leads to a future worthy of both our peoples. As Jack's words faded, a profound silence fell over the battlefield. Then, slowly at first, but with growing momentum, weapons were lowered. Ship after ship powered down its offensive systems. On the command channels, voices from both sides began to call for a ceasefire. Even Pax Kyle, his grand plans in ruins, found himself moved by the vision Jack had shown. Perhaps, the industrialist voice came over the general frequency, heavy with the weight of realization, I have been pursuing the wrong kind of power all along. As the tensions of battle gave way to the tentative first steps of reconciliation, Jack felt a wave of exhaustion wash over him. He had pushed his abilities to their absolute limit and beyond. But as he looked out at the earth below, seeing human and alien ships now flying side by side in a makeshift honor guard, he knew it had been worth it. Emma's ship pulled alongside him, her face appearing on his viewscreen. Her eyes were filled with tears of joy and wonder. You did it, Jack. You really did it. Jack smiled, feeling the weight of his transformation and the responsibility it brought. No, Emma. We did it. All of us and our work is just beginning. As they descended back to Earth, Jack knew that the path ahead would be challenging. There would be resistance, setbacks, and moments of doubt. But he had seen the potential future, had felt the power of true unity, and he was ready to guide both humans and aliens towards that brighter tomorrow, one step at a time. As the dust settled from the battle, Earth entered a period of unprecedented change. The Skynet Project, now bolstered by the full cooperation of both human and alien forces, began its monumental task of restoring the planet's atmosphere. Jack, still coming to terms with his newfound abilities, took on the role of project coordinator. His unique position as a bridge between species made him invaluable in navigating the complex interplay of human and alien technologies. Months passed, and the first results began to show Pollutants were slowly filtered out of the air, greenhouse gas levels started to stabilize, and the ozone layer began to repair itself. The changes were subtle at first, but as time went on, they became impossible to ignore. One crisp morning, Emma burst into the control center, her eyes wide with excitement. Jack, Zin, you need to see this. She pulled up a holographic display showing global atmospheric readings, the data was clear Earth's air quality had improved by over 30% in just six months. Zin's antennae quivered with excitement. And look at these readings from our people. The healing properties of the atmosphere are not only stable, but seem to be intensifying. As news of the project's success spread, a wave of hope washed over both species. For humans, it was the promise of a cleaner, healthier world. For the aliens, it was the assurance that their new home could sustain them for generations to come. The transformation wasn't limited to the atmosphere. As the air cleared, ecosystems began to recover at an astonishing rate. Forests regrew, coral reefs rebounded, and long dormant species began to reappear. This environmental renaissance brought with it a new era of scientific discovery. Human and alien researchers worked side by side unraveling the mysteries of Earth's resilience and applying their findings to other worlds. But as the project progressed, new questions and challenges emerged. The success of the atmospheric restoration had fundamentally altered the relationship between humans and aliens. No longer were they simply cohabitants of a troubled world, they were now partners in its renewal and stewardship. During a high-level meeting of human and alien leaders, 
Jack addressed these emerging concerns. We've achieved something remarkable together, he began, his voice carrying the weight of his unique perspective. But our work is far from over. We need to consider what this new Earth means for both our species. The discussion that followed was intense. Questions of land distribution, resource management, and governance in this new shared world were debated fiercely. Some humans feared that the aliens' longer lifespans would give them an unfair advantage in long-term planning. Conversely, some aliens worried that humans' rapid adaptability might lead to them dominating the renewed Earth. As tensions rose, Jack felt a familiar surge of energy. He closed his eyes, reaching out with his enhanced abilities to connect the minds in the room. But instead of imposing a shared vision as he had during the battle, he created a space for true empathy and understanding. Leaders from both species suddenly found themselves experiencing the hopes, fears, and perspectives of their counterparts. The aliens felt the deep, ancestral connection humans had to Earth, the weight of its history, and the fear of losing it. Humans, in turn, experienced the profound gratitude and sense of responsibility the aliens felt towards their adopted home. As Jack gently withdrew the connection, the atmosphere in the room had changed dramatically. The debate continued, but now with a newfound respect and understanding on both sides. We're not just sharing a planet, Jack said softly. We're creating a new civilization together. One that has the potential to reach further and achieve more than either of our species could alone. In the weeks that followed, a new framework for cooperation began to take shape. Joint councils were established to oversee the continued restoration of Earth and to plan for the future. Educational exchanges were set up, allowing humans and aliens to learn from each other's histories and cultures. But perhaps the most significant development came in the form of a new joint space program. With Earth's restoration well underway, both species turned their gaze to the stars. The combined knowledge of human ingenuity and alien technology promised to unlock the secrets of interstellar travel. As Jack stood on the observation deck of the newly constructed orbital station, watching shuttles from both species dock and depart, he felt a profound sense of accomplishment tinged with anticipation. Earth, gleaming blue and green below, was healing. But it was no longer the end goal, it was the starting point for something far greater. Emma joined him her eyes reflecting the starry expanse before them. It's beautiful, isn't it? She said softly. Everything we've accomplished, everything that's still to come. Jack nodded, a smile playing on his lips. This is just the beginning, Emma. We've learned to heal a world together. Now, we're going to explore the universe as one. As they stood there, watching the busy traffic of a truly interstellar civilization taking its first steps, both Jack and Emma knew that the challenges ahead would be immense. The restoration of Earth was a monumental achievement, but it was also a prelude to even greater adventures and discoveries. The future was unwritten, filled with possibilities both thrilling and daunting. But as long as humans and aliens continued to work together, drawing strength from their differences and united in their shared vision, there was no challenge they couldn't overcome. The stars awaited, and Earth's united children were ready to answer their call. The observation deck of the International Space Station hummed with excitement as Jack and Emma pored over the latest data from their joint human-alien research team. Holographic displays flickered around them, showing atmospheric readings from various exoplanets. This is incredible, Emma breathed, her eyes wide with wonder. The combination of our adaptability and their terraforming tech it's like we've found the key to the universe. Jack nodded, his enhanced mind rapidly processing the implications. We're not just talking about making marginally habitable worlds livable. We could potentially transform gas giants, ice planets, even worlds orbiting in the darkness between stars. As they delved deeper into their findings, a transmission came through from Zinn, who was coordinating with alien scientists on Earth. Jack, Emma, are you seeing this? The potential applications are beyond anything we imagined. The discovery was revolutionary. Human Dina's remarkable adaptability, when combined with the aliens' advanced atmospheric manipulation technology, created a synergy that allowed for rapid adaptation to almost any environment. 
worlds that would have taken centuries to terraform could now be made habitable in decades, if not years. News of the breakthrough spread quickly, igniting a new wave of excitement and ambition among both species. Plans for joint exploration missions were drawn up almost overnight, with teams of human and alien scientists eager to test their new capabilities on distant worlds. But as humanity and their alien allies turned their gaze to the stars with renewed vigor, they found that the galaxy was watching them in return. It started with subtle signals anomalous readings from deep space probes, unexplained energy signatures at the edge of the solar system. Then came the unmistakable evidence. Earth was being observed by multiple advanced civilizations. Jack sensed the shift before anyone else, his enhanced abilities picking up on the subtle changes in the cosmic background radiation. We're not alone out there, he announced during an emergency meeting of Earth's United Council. And I don't just mean our allies. There are others, watching us, assessing us. The revelation sent shockwaves through both human and alien communities. They had been so focused on their own cooperation and advancement that they'd failed to consider their place in the larger galactic community. As the reality of their situation sank in, debates raged across Earth. Some saw this as an opportunity for even greater alliances and knowledge exchange. Others feared that humanity and their alien partners had inadvertently painted a target on themselves, showcasing capabilities that more advanced races might see as a threat. Emma, ever the voice of scientific curiosity, argued for openness. We can't hide what we've achieved, nor should we want to. This could be our chance to join a galactic community, to learn and grow in ways we can't even imagine. But there were voices of caution as well. Zin, drawing on their species' longer history of space exploration, urged restraint. We must approach this carefully. Not all civilizations out there may share our values or our desire for peaceful coexistence. As the debate continued, Jack found himself once again in the position of mediator and visionary. Using his unique abilities, he reached out, trying to sense the intentions of the watching civilizations, what he found was a complex tapestry of curiosity, caution, and in some cases, trepidation. We're at a crossroads, Jack addressed the council, his voice carrying the weight of his cosmic awareness. How we handle this moment will define our place in the galaxy for generations to come. We can't approach this from a position of fear, but we also can't be naive. Drawing on the combined wisdom of human history and alien experience, a plan began to take shape. They would send out a message not just of peace and friendship, but one that showcased the unique strengths of their alliance. They would demonstrate how the combination of human adaptability and alien technology could benefit all species, offering to share their breakthroughs in environmental restoration and planetary adaptation. As the message was crafted and preparations were made to broadcast it across the galaxy, Jack couldn't help but feel a mix of excitement and apprehension. They were about to step onto a much larger stage, one filled with unknown players and unfathomable challenges. Are we ready for this? Emma asked, standing beside him as they watched the powerful transmitters align for the broadcast. Jack smiled, taking her hand. Ready or not, this is our moment. We've learned to heal a world and work across species lines. Now it's time to take those lessons to the stars. As the signal beamed out into the cosmos, carrying humanity and their allies' hopes and achievements to distant worlds, Earth held its collective breath. They had announced their presence to the galaxy at large, showcasing their potential as partners in cosmic exploration and environmental stewardship. The response, when it came, would open a new chapter in the story of Earth and its people both human and alien. Whatever challenges lay ahead, they would face them together, armed with the strength of their diversity and the power of their united vision. The galaxy was vast and full of wonders, and Earth's united children were finally ready to take their place among the stars. Jack stood at the viewport of the massive colony ship, the Harmony, watching as Earth grew smaller in the distance. The blue marble that had been humanity's cradle for millennia was now just one of many worlds they called home. Beside him, Emma and Zinn gazed out at the stars, their faces a mixture of excitement and nostalgia. It's hard to believe how far we've come, 
Emma said softly, her hand intertwined with Jack's. From thinking we were alone in the universe to leading an interstellar colonization mission. Zen's antennae quivered in agreement. Indeed, who would have thought that the very air we once considered toxic would become the key to unlocking the galaxy? Jack smiled, his enhanced senses taking in not just the view before him, but the bustling activity throughout the ship. Humans and aliens worked side by side, their complementary skills and knowledge creating a synergy that still amazed him. As they watched the final preparations for the jump to light speed, Jack's mind drifted back to the tumultuous journey that had brought them to this point. The initial fear and mistrust, the battles against those who resisted change, the painstaking process of learning to communicate and cooperate across species lines, it all seemed like a lifetime ago. You know, Jack mused, I remember when we first discovered that Earth's atmosphere was poisonous to our alien friends. We thought it was a curse, an insurmountable obstacle to coexistence. Emma nodded, recalling those tense early days. And now it's our greatest asset. Our adaptability, combined with their technology, it's opened up worlds we never dreamed possible. Zinn added, their voice filled with wonder, the resilience of human physiology, honed by millennia of evolution in Earth's challenging environment, has proven to be the missing piece in our species' quest for the stars. Together, we're achieving what neither of us could alone. As if on cue, a holographic display sprang to life before them, showing their destination, a distant planet once thought to be uninhabitable. Thanks to the combined efforts of human scientists and alien engineers, it would soon be home to the first truly interstellar colony. Jack felt a swell of pride as he looked at the diverse crew around him. Humans from every corner of Earth worked alongside aliens of various species, each bringing their unique perspectives and abilities to the mission. What had once been seen as irreconcilable differences had become their greatest strength. Captain, a voice called from the bridge, we're ready for the jump to light speed, awaiting your command. Jack took a deep breath, savoring the moment. He turned to Emma and Zinn, his closest friends and advisors. Shall we make history? With their nods of approval, Jack stepped onto the bridge. The crew, both human and alien, looked to him with respect and anticipation. He had come a long way from the Arctic researcher who first made contact with an alien species. Now, he stood as a symbol of what could be achieved through cooperation and understanding. My friends, Jack addressed the crew, his voice carrying throughout the ship. As we embark on this journey, we carry with us the hopes and dreams of not just one world, but many. We've overcome our fears, our prejudices, and even the very laws of nature that once seemed to divide us. He paused, looking at each face before him human, alien, and everything in between. What we once saw as our greatest weakness has become our greatest strength. Our ability to adapt, to thrive in the face of adversity, has opened up the galaxy to us. But more importantly, it has opened our hearts and minds to new possibilities, new friendships, and a future brighter than we ever imagined. Emma stepped forward, adding her own words of encouragement. Together, we're not just exploring the stars. We're building bridges between worlds, between species, Every challenge we face, we face as one. Zinn completed the trio, their antennae glowing with emotion. Let this journey be a testament to what can be achieved when we embrace our differences and work towards a common goal. The universe is vast, but together, there's no limit to what we can accomplish. With a final nod to his co-leaders, Jack gave the command. Engage light speed. Let's show the galaxy what Earth's children can do. As the harmony leapt into the swirling vortex of faster-than-light travel, Jack felt a profound sense of hope and purpose. The challenges ahead were immense, but he knew they were ready. Humanity had found its place in the cosmos, not as conquerors or subjects, but as partners in a grand, interstellar community. The story of Earth's toxic air had come full circle. What was once a barrier had become a gateway, leading them to a future filled with endless possibilities. As the stars streaked by outside, Jack knew that this was just the beginning of humanity's greatest adventure. Together with their alien allies, 
They were writing a new chapter in the history of the universe, one of unity, discovery, and the triumph of cooperation over conflict. The journey ahead was long, but with each light year they traveled, they moved closer to a future where the very concept of alien would fade away, replaced by a shared identity as explorers and caretakers of the cosmic tapestry they all called home.